right, Andrew. This is the Midnight Ocean, and I am your host, Jeff Norton, coming to you live from the Sunshine State on the Nature Coast. <laughs> Who is fixing? That's a southern term, fixing. For those up above the Mason Dixon line, that means it's going to happen. Let me give you Urban Dictionary translation there. Fixing means it is going to happen. But we're fixing to get hit by our first hurricane in 12 years. Yeah. Yeah, good times. <laughs> the good news is, is that the NOAA trucks and the weather trucks have moved up the road about 50 miles, which is good for us. Well, I, I've been told actually that's bad for us. That is bad for us. That means that we're going to be on the outer edge of the storm, which apparently that is where the strongest winds are. <laughs> They're calling for sustained winds at about 50 miles an hour. It's not too not too bad. It's gonna, more of a tropical storm, but they've told us on the coast that they just go ahead and get ready as a hurricane. It's going to be a small one, but who knows? You know, <laughs> You never know with these things until they actually hit so we are hunkering down we are battening down the hatches here at central studio I find it kind of ironic that we have to tie our boats down <laughs> for a hurricane but yes they are not sailboats so we're preparing tomorrow will be a day of getting ready for the worst and hoping for the best and that actually leads us to a program note um obviously now here at, at central studio I, I i'll have to tell you we have battery backup we have gener i mean we're good to go the problem is is the feed outside of the studio i can't i can't control that i can't control that what the good news is is prior about 10 years ago right down the street from me was a nuclear power plant so the infrastructure right here is pretty robust. <laughs> yeah, a, a former nuclear power plant. They they actually shut it down. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't as robust as I thought. <laughs> the more I think about it. So no, we're we're good. We're we're all good. And uh, send out our prayers. You know, for for everybody that's going to be affected by this storm. I hope uh, I hope you are safe. And uh, just keep watching. But like I said, tomorrow we might not be on the air. But I want to make sure that you know that it is because of Mother Nature, not Mother Government. We've been talking about some pretty crazy things here. Uh, you know, I expect the doors to be kicked in. Talking about crazy. Last night was an incredible show. Oh, my goodness. If you did not watch the show last night or listen to the show last night with Linda Zimmerman talking about the Hudson Valley UFOs and the Hudson Valley stone buildings and and her experience as a ghost investigator. You need to get out there and listen to it. You really, really do. It was, you know, <laughs> I'm still laughing. Uh, I'm still laughing because tonight's guest is Manu Interami is going to be joining us. And for you that don't know, he was a, uh, a Borg on, on the Star Trek series. He was, well, he was in later and then One Tree Hill, you know, extensive. Get out to our website, The Midnight Ocean, and you can look at his, his collection of movies and TV shows that he's been on. And it's just prolific. He's got a new project called The Circuit. We'll let him talk about that when he comes on the guest. But there's a scene there. Where it's just hilarious. It, it, you know, aliens messing with aliens. Or aliens messing with people. And it reminded me of last night's show. I, I got a laugh out of Linda, you know, telling a story about a lady who... And, you know, serious stuff. You shouldn't laugh about this. But she was abducted, right? Out of her out of her window. While she was asleep. And she woke up and she told her husband that something, you know, something strange happened. And her husband being a scientist... Was like, yeah, what the heck? Yeah, you're crazy. So he went outside and he comes running back in in a panic and he's like, call everybody. Yeah, <laughs> call everybody. He's doing... So if you go to Linda's Hudson Valley UFO book, 
she's got a picture of it and it's so funny and it reminded me i was watching the circuit i was watching some of the promos that our guest tonight is doing uh manu and tarami was was doing on the circuit and and it just tickled me because it was one of these things where i can see aliens when you have that much power or you, you, know, you have a big mothership yeah it's okay to screw with people <laughs> And so what happened was, is that going back to the story where this husband comes running in and he's in a panic. So apparently what happened was, is that they were doing some construction work and they had a big mound of sand, you know, for filler and construction or cement or whatever. Well, well, the alien <laughs> apparently parked his ship on that mound and compressed it. She's got pictures of it where, where it literally flattened out the mound and it, you know, burned and we talked about that at last night's show. Now, that's the kind of crap I would do if I was an alien and had a spaceship. I'd be flattening things. I'd be... <laughs> and, uh, and it was funny because I was watching the, the circuit, some of the promos there, and they're, you know, they're up in their starship and they're messing, messing with the guy that's on the ground, making them go get Pokemon, capture Pokemon. Um characters and they're messing with them it's hilarious and you know that's the kind of stuff i would do that's why i would probably never be asked to uh to be a commander of an interstellar fleet because i'd just be messing with the humans <laughs> i i really would i'd just be landing I, exactly what they did i'd be landing my spacecraft <laughs> on, on stuff can you imagine Coming, coming, waking up the next morning and walking out, your truck is like three inches thick, <laughs> just squashed like a grape. <laughs> I see, and then I'd have some alien, you know, because of course I'm not going to write it in English, <laughs> but some alien thing. Jeff was here. You might want to get this fixed, <laughs> or better, wash me. <laughs> But it'll be an alien <laughs> language. I could, I could do that. that that's why. I, that's that, there you go. That's why I could never command an interstellar spaceship because I would just blow stuff up and just have a good old time. You know, do an air show. Go to you know. You imagine that people at an air show, military air show, and just kind of <laughs> just kind of fly your your spaceship in formation. With the other airplanes, people will be looking at each other, going, wait a minute, <laughs> and then take off. Oh, Lord. See, I, I couldn't do it. I, I'd get that phone call from High Command. Uh, Jeff, uh, can you please report back to Mother Station? <laughs> I just, <laughs> I got so tickled though watching it. So we're going to talk about his show the circuit his upcoming uh, project called the circuit it's pretty cool stuff that's going on there talk about star trek renegades some of the things that they're doing and uh it, it's just it's going to be a great show i already tell you you know like i said when you talk to people you know that you're just gonna have a good time and th i can tell you this is going to be fun this is this is going to be fun so stick around at the bottom of the hour he'll be coming in we don't know what time he's actually it was funny he, he's getting a headshot done he's out in la and he, we were talking on the thing and he told me he's getting a headshot now see for me being a you know being a redneck i'm like dude duck <laughs> you need a duck you, you know don't stand don't stand there and take it learn how to duck so yeah so he he'll be texting then and we'll get him on the air Sometime, sometime around the bottom of the hour. So some house cleaning, keeping. I don't know if I should, house cleaning, housekeeping. I don't know what to call it. But some, let's just call it selfless promotion here. So if you're out on YouTube, make sure that you follow us, subscribe to us. We are so close to hitting 80 subscribers. You know, the magic number, well, the magic number is a couple hundred thousand but you gotta start out small i get it the magic number apparently for the youtube world is about a hundred subscriptions 
that is where YouTube starts to take notice to you. Uh, I did not know this, but statistically speaking, they said that if you're at 100 subscriptions or more, you're in the top 10% of all YouTubers. Uh, yeah, I didn't know that. That just goes to tell you how many other crappy shows like mine are out there. <laughs> so, so no, we hit 100, then we, yeah, then we know we're game. I'll tell you though, some good news. Uh, I know we're game. I know we, I, I, we're, we're progressing. We're doing exactly what we are supposed to be doing. So I'm very, very happy about that. We are talking with a syndicator. Yes, it is true. It is true. We are officially in talks with a syndicator who syndicates a lot of various shows. So that is good news. I can I can let that cat out of the bag. That just means I have to tighten it up. <laughs> I have to I have to turn this ship and this crew into a cohesive product. So in the next couple of weeks, we will be reaching out to ra radio stations. One of the things that you can do to help us is if you know of a radio station that offers talk radio at night at a.m., it doesn't matter. I mean, we are actually geared towards the smaller stations, you know, because we're not going to compete with the, with the premier. So we will, but not right now. We, we're like that camel. We got to get our nose under the tent, right? So if you know of an AM small mom and pop station in your area, please let us know. We will reach out to them. Better yet, you can reach out to them. That would be awesome if you let them know about us. But we will be reaching out to various uh, stations here in the next couple of weeks. And we will start the process of syndication. That's good, though. I mean, I guess we're doing something, right? Right? Who would ever thought? I actually gave myself six months in this in this one. I I actually thought that we would be where we're at today six months from now. So I think we are doing fairly, fairly well. On top of that, like I said, if you're out on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. If you are a Facebooker, Facebooker, please make sure that you follow us. Type in the Midnight Ocean. And also, we have a group set up for the listeners called Midnight Listeners. Follow us on Twitter at the MN Ocean and TMO Guest TMO, hashtag TMO Host. Those are the social media plugs. No, no MySpace. <laughs> so we're, we're keeping it simple around here. So yeah, good news. We're, we're, we're going to, you know, start looking at being syndicated on terrestrial stations, but we're never going to change here. We're always going to be here on the web, here on YouTube, here in the podcast, which is really nice. I can promise you, we will not switch over to subscription based system, which a lot of other mainstream shows such as ourselves have done. So we're going to keep it as a podcast so that you can always download the shows if you miss them on your radio stations. So that's good news. I think. I think. Now, tonight's hat. I'm still keeping the Noah hat. We're still in a hurricane watch until tomorrow the hurricane's going to hit us tomorrow about midday mid-afternoon the concerning part is that it is stalled in the gulf which is not good <laughs> that means it is gaining more strength more power as it sucks up more water it's pretty warm out there in the gulf i did not realize until i actually moved here i mean the gulf the gulf temperature water temperature is about 82 degrees yeah, so it's it's pretty warm. That water's warm. 
And so as it stalls, it, you know, it, it, it's going to pick up more and more power. So we're, we were watching it today and it just kind of stopped. The good news is, is the longer it sits, the more northerly it moves. I'm learning a lot, <laughs> becoming a little, a little weather, weather hound here. Uh, but the longer it sits, the more, the more northerly it will travel, which, you know, I don't want those poor people in Louisiana, we, you know, pray for them with the flooding and, and, and everything, but it is starting to, to move more northerly than what it was. Originally, it was going to make landfall about 20 miles from the studio here. And now it is about 150 miles north, a little bit further up the coast. But I was all, I was like, good, <laughs> we dodged a bullet. No, <laughs> I was informed that actually we will be on the upward cycle. So we're south of the eye. So we will be on the upward cycle, which is where the strongest winds actually are. So they're telling us that we're going to have sustained winds of about 50 miles an hour. It's going to be fun. We're going to go out and fly a kite. No, I'm going to be hunkered down like the rest of us, staying out of trouble. Yeah, I have full faith. The, the, the only... Well, I have full faith. Let me finish that thought. The full faith in the construction here. I we just went through a, a, a construction project. <laughs> just just finished it on Saturday. And but I, I saw how they built it and it, it's tied down and um, we're really, really confident that the structure will be fine. The problem is is because I live in a place called the nature coast we have trees all around us pine palm trees everything else so we're a little concerned about that we'll see we will see so like i said if we're off the air tomorrow it is not because of mother country it is because of mother nature but we will get back as soon as we can and i'll try to send out some instagram pictures and things of that nature you know, we do have an Instagram account. I just never really used it because I, I just don't, you know, selfies and stuff. That's kind of narcissistic. But I think when you are in the middle of a major news story, I mean, this is the first hurricane to hit Florida in 12 years. I, you know, that we'll go out to the golf. We'll take a drive out to the golf and uh, take some pictures for you guys. And get those posted on Instagram tomorrow and maybe we'll... Get some pictures of me trying to walk against the wind. <laughs> so that will be interesting. Tonight's group, if you haven't figured it out, on Facebook is the circuit. That's right. Get out there. It's this type in the circuit. And for those who are dictionary challenged, it's C I R C U I. And it's the, or the, well, it's the, because it's the only one. So it's the circuit. That is a new project. And I'm going to let our very special guest who's going to be joining us here at the bottom of the hour, thereabouts. He's, like I said, he's taking care of some business there in L.A. But, uh. It is a project that he's put together with several, it's it's amazing, several former Trek, Trekkie uh, actors and various other actors. And I'll let him tell you who they are and who they're involved and what the project about. But that, the guest is Manu Interami. He will be joining us some, somewhere about the bottom of the hour. Pretty cool stuff, especially for all of us geeks. You know, I'm going to try not to geek out too much. You, you know, that's one thing, though. I, I can honestly say I was, I love Star Trek. I love Star Wars. I love Battlestar Galactic. I love all those shows because I grew up on them. But I never really got into the crazy cosplay aspect of it. 
the way I looked at it is, yeah, that's all we need. Another fat man going to a convention. <laughs> Dressed up like, you know, like the board. It's like, the first requirement, you would think in the future they would have a pill or something that you wouldn't have fat people. <laughs> you don't see any fat people in the future. <laughs> in these shows. So why would I dress up and act like some captain of some ship when I can barely touch my toes? So yeah, I, I just never really got into the cosplay aspect of it. We're going to talk about that. I'm sure he's got some stories. I'm going to put him on the spot. Because I am sure that he's got some stories. When I talk to some of our musician buddies, there's a lot of the stories they have they can't tell us. <laughs> well, we can't tell on the air. <laughs> but uh, I will, I'm will. i sure Manu's got some pretty good trekky stories. <laughs> some pretty good um, experiences that he will possibly share with us. So so tonight's Facebook group is the circuit. Get out there and do that. If you are on the internet now, they have uh, some video sections. And the right hand side they have the video. And they have the one video with Russ, which is hilarious. He's doing like a promo shoot. But just under that video, they have another another one and it's uh let me see if we can get the title of that one. You have to watch it because it made me laugh. And it was so funny because it was so appropriate that Tim Russ explains the circuit. That's the first video that they did. And you can get that off of Facebook. And then the second one is what is the circuit uh, video. Yeah, got to catch them all is the title of the second one. Got to catch them all. And that's got mine. <laughs> and it's so funny because they're just messing with them. And like I said, it was so appropriate. When I saw that, I about I was laughing so hard and everything because it reminded me of last night's show as we were talking with Linda Zimmerman and how the alien came and parked their, or their, 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 aircraft, their craft right on a pile of sand, of construction sand, and just flattened it out and turned it to glass. She's got pictures. It's actually on the picture of Hudson Valley UFOs. It's the it's the picture of the bottom. You can see it. It was done with a Polaroid because it happened in the 80s. Didn't have cell phones, right? Well, you did, but they didn't take pictures. So it was, it was Polaroids that were done. But you could still see it. It's pretty clear. And uh, that's the kind of stuff I would do as an alien. But get out there. Watch those videos, and then when Manu gets back on, we'll, we'll definitely have a conversation about them. But it, it was it was fun, and that's the kind of stuff that I would see. I wouldn't be looking if I had that kind of power. I would not be looking at interplanetary domination. I'd just be messing with people. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of alien I am. Maybe that's a good poll that we should have. What kind of alien would you be? Would you be the the human eating alien? Would you be the city destroying alien? Or would you be the messing with humans aliens? That's me. I'd be messing with people. I'd be boo. <laughs> I think if I was a ghost, that's what I would be doing too. I would be the one saying, get out. And say, no, nah, just joking. You can stay. No, get out. <laughs> so that's, that is, um, that would be a good pull. You know, what, what, I've seen the one, what would, what would you do if you saw an alien or an alien craft? But my thing would be, what would you do if you were an alien? Would you be a humanoid eating alien? Would you be a city destroying alien? Or would you be just a messing with the human alien? And I think I would definitely be in the messing with the human mode. So once again, there is the music in my ears and on your speakers telling us that we are ready to go for a break. When we get back from the break, we are going to have, hopefully, hopefully, Manu Interami will be joining us after he gets done with his business. But uh, hopefully, we'll keep our fingers crossed. But you're listening to the Midnight Ocean Radio Show and Podcast. I am your host, Jeff Norton. Join us here every weeknight from 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or on the web at www.themidnightocean. This 
is the Midnight Ocean with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. Midnight Ocean with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. Jeff Norton of the Midnight Ocean Radio Show and Podcast. I'm here every weeknight from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, the good news is that is actually going to be changing 
That is right. We are going to go to a five-hour show, guys. <laughs> it is coming. That is correct. Let me tell you why. I know we have a lot in the chat room that just that just joined us. So you guys probably missed the first segment. So I will repeat the, for, oh, the whole first segment for you, starting from the beginning. No. We are waiting for our very special guest, Manu Itarami, to join us. Now, he did have a prior commitment, and he said that he might be running a little bit late. That's okay. He's probably stuck in L.A. traffic because he's calling in from L.A. For those that don't know who Manu is, he's a trackie, fairly well-known trackie. Not going to do your homework for you. Put it in a Googler. His name's M-A-N-U, and just type in I. But better yet, if you want to know some of his work, get out to his Facebook page, The Circuit. That's actually where you should be going. Support their efforts there. Pretty cool stuff that they're doing, and we'll let him talk to you about that. So just shot him a text, and we're waiting for him. I can stall. That's the nice thing about doing live, live radio. So, so yeah, we're going to be changing our format up. And the reason being, guys, is we are actually in conversations with a syndicator, a network syndicator. And we're going to go right after that midnight to 5 a.m. market. Yeah. We're going to go right up against the big boys. So we will be changing our hours here when we start bringing in more and more radio stations. So that is going to be very cool. Yeah, so we're going to go to a five-hour show starting. It's going to run from 12, 12 a.m. Eastern till 5 a.m. So it's going to be two hours later and two hours earlier. I know some of you guys who are out there saying that the, the 10 o'clock is, is rough is, uh, and now we're going to 12 o'clock and it will be, it, it won't be for a while. So you have time to adjust. And one of the things, because what's very important about this show is, is actually the call in. We want to hear from you. Our listeners. It's not all about me. It's about our guests and the listeners. Now, one of the things, too, that we have done or we're implementing, we're playing with it, is we are creating a listener Skype line. So we will be able to, you will be able to call us on our hybrid using Skype. We find that the quality of the Skype is just 10 times better than the phones. I think phones are as, as much as I'm in the business, but as much as I like them, I have to say they are going away. It's kind of like the typewriter. The days of the typewriter, typewriter are going away. It's okay. I remember talking about typewriters. You want to mess with your kids? We were at a garage sale one and I had my daughter, my youngest daughter with me. And there was a typewriter there for sale. And she was like, what is that? And I told her, I said, it's a, per- it's a portable printer. She's like, really? I said, yeah. I said, you can go there and you can type your paper. And it's portable. And she thought that was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> and she's the smart one. <laughs> In the bunch. Oh, uh, but uh, no, she thought that was the coolest thing. And then it dawned on her, it clicked. And of, of course, I she punched me. <laughs> but no, you know, technology changes. So we are adding Skype lines for you you guys instead of using the phone lines. We find, like I said, the quality is so much better. You can download Skype now and put it on your mobile device, any mobile device that you want to. And with your earphones and everything, you will get, we will get superb audio. I was listening to the shows the other night 
Skype versus the hybrid, and Skype is so much better. I mean, it is, it is hands down the best technology for this. Now, you know, the Skype video is kind of sketchy. It's really sketchy, but the, the, the Skype audio is just, just incredible. So we look forward to getting that stood up. I, we, we created the accounts and everything so that you guys can then Skype in and we can talk on that. So, yep. So as I told you guys, we are going to a syndicator. And we will be here shortly. We're going to start reaching out to various radio stations. So keep your fingers crossed. One of the things you can do to help us is that if you know of a radio station that you listen to that doesn't have any nighttime pro I don't care if they have nighttime programming either. We'll go against them. We're pretty competitive. One of the things that we're going to be doing is our show runs our clock what they call show clock it's an hour long right 60 minutes eight minutes so we take four minutes at the bottom of the hour and four minutes at the top and that is for advertising if you if you listen we start the music at 25 minutes after kind of give a cue and then at 26 we go to break same you know 55 minutes at the top then 56 we go to break so there's four minutes there at the bottom of the top we're actually going to give that four minutes to our radio, our terrestrial radio stations in advertising. Because we believe that all, you know, tides raise all ships. So what happens is that we're going to give them eight minutes a show, an hour, I mean, that they can do their advertising. The other thing that's really cool is that we're going to mandate to them that they podcast that on their on their show now a lot of guys who are in this business if you listen and i won't tell you who they are there's no reason to disparage other guys we're all in the same business and it's it's okay it's a big it's a big world competition's healthy now but i will tell you this a lot of the other shows don't allow their radio stations to podcast during their show they won't allow them to play the show because they want that podcast revenue to come back to them. We're not going to do that. We're going to tell our radio stations, you get eight minutes an hour for advertising. It's yours. We're going to allow you to podcast the show with your advertising. We don't care. You have your podcast. I have mine. Yeah, it's pretty fair. I think we're going to, we're going to chew up the market. And on top of that, our guests, that's the other thing too that I made it perfectly clear with this syndicator, unlike the other syndicators that I've dealt with in the past on other shows. The guests that we have are going to be controversial. We're not going to kowtow to the corporate interests out there. Not at all. Nope. We are going to have our guests, and we are going to continue to have our conversations with them. That will not change. I was talking to a guest today. I, you know, a lot of my guests, if you don't know, or a lot of them have been on some of the major shows back and forth. I mean, they, they've been on the shows. And they, hands down, like our format better. Because we allow them to speak their mind. We, we don't curtail. The only requirement that I have, if you're going to be a guest on this show, it's, it's very simple. Do I have to believe you? No, I don't have to believe you. There's a lot of things I don't agree with from our guests. The only requirement is, though, that you believe you. If, you, if you're just going to come on the show to sell books or whatever, that, yeah, okay, move on. But if you have a theory or an opinion that's contradictive to my beliefs or whatever, I, I don't care. Because I think it's important that we, it, it's a big world. We have to be exposed to other belief systems. First guess, Kim Jong-un. LinkedIn News. I, that, I, I would love to get him on. Actually, I would. 
I would love to get him on the show. And the, it's like, dude, what are you thinking? <laughs> I'll fly over there. What's that comedy? That was a classic comedy. I would. I, I, I would. I'd have any guest. I don't care. Everybody's got a story to tell. As horrific as it might be, everybody's got a story to tell. You know, maybe he just wasn't coddled well enough. I, I, who knows? <laughs> maybe he just needs a hug. I'll tell you one thing. He needs to get rid of the guy who cuts his hair. It's pretty bad. <laughs> you know what's really scary, though? You talk about Kim Jong-un. I, I think, doesn't... Uh, well, okay. I've been told to stay... That, that's the one requirement. I've been told to stay away from the hardcore politics, right? But I can't... I can't stress... All right, well, all right. So, let me do this. Let me... Let me correlate because i don't want anybody to come back and say jeb norton said that kim that hillary clinton dresses like kim jong-un all right so forget that last statement that i just put out there forget that <laughs> all right just forget that statement you know dr evil dresses like kim jong-un you know dr evil yeah one million <laughs> and hillary clinton dresses like dr evil there you go so don't accuse me of saying Hillary Clinton's Kim Jong-un. But do you not notice the pantsuits? They must have the same tailor. They, they really do. I, that was one thing I've always noticed about, about Hillary. Is that uh, her outfits look so Mao, Mao Zedong-ish. <laughs> That's a word. Put that in the Urban Dictionary. So, that's enough of the politics. <laughs> Get in trouble. That's not... We will have... There will be time where we will have politics. Because there's nothing more scarier than, than these politicians. These, these, these idiots with the power that, that they've been given. That's pretty scary stuff. Pretty, pretty scary stuff. Talk about scary stuff. I don't know if you guys saw it in the news today here in Florida. We have this problem, in, in Central, especially where I'm at, Nature's Coast. We have black bears. It's crazy. I used to, you know, when I lived up in the UP and we lived up in northern Michigan and, and we would go up to Wisconsin, I never saw a bear unless I was trying to hunt one. And even then we'd have to go pretty far and we'd, it was different. Down here in Florida... I've seen more black bears than I've seen gators. That's right. I've seen more black bears than I've seen alligators. The, um, the, I mean, it's crazy. It's insane. But there's a video out today and it happened right down the street, apparently from our, from our house. And yeah, I mean, so a lady sitting out on her driveway here in Florida. And a black bear just comes up and walks right up to her, and she's videotaping it. Probably not wanting to move. And he just walks up, sniffs her phone, kind of <laughs> introduces himself. Hey, boo boo, got a big in the basket. But, uh, and then just goes on his merry way. That's pretty, pretty intense stuff. I don't know what I would do. I probably would have done the same thing because you don't want to frighten the bear. Don't poke the bear, as they say. Not the one to poke the bear. So as you guys know, we are waiting for our guest to show up, Manu Intorami. He is out in LA. He had some other commitments, and he did tell me today when we talked that he had some some other commitments that he had to take care of getting ready for his new projects. And, you know, that's his business. That's his life. That's how he pays his bills and everything. So that's okay. So we'll just soldier on. Yeah. So, you know, talk. Oh, yeah. Not so much politics. How about Area 51 and S4? Link to news. Absolutely, my friend. Absolutely. That's not politics. 
That's science. That's disinformation. That's psycho warfare. It's a whole different topic. And that's actually what we like to talk about here on the show. And as we wait, if you guys want to, if you want to give us a call, you I guess we can go ahead and open up the phone lines as we wait for our guest to show up. I'll post that. It's 312-588-1200. 312-588-1200. You guys can call in. We can have an open topic, open line, as we are waiting as I patiently for our guests to show up. Yeah, Bob Lazar is pretty cool, pretty cool cat. And for those that don't know, so I'm looking off to the side. So those that don't know, let me, let me take this time to kind of, because we're, we're still new and some of you guys don't know that we have a lot of new listeners that come on every day. We're growing every day, adding new and new listeners. And what, what's impressive about the listeners is that they're loyalty to the show, which is very important. Right, you get these these one offs that come in and go away. We we have a lot of retention. All of our numbers on YouTube are positive as far as our insights go, and and everything. So we're really really happy with that. But for those that don't know, that are out there listening in the audio land, if you, we have a chat room in YouTube that we use, and that's the only chat room that we use during the show. So if you'd like to chat with me during the show, if you'd like to distract me, during <laughs> The show, please feel free to go out to YouTube. Type in the Midnight Ocean, and you'll see the uh, you'll see us. We're at the top of the list, and then from there you can see our live shows. You'll see a little thing that says live, a little red thing that says live over the video feed, and you can watch us live. And the other part of that is it allows you to chat with us on the show. So we 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 encourage that. We want this is a guest friendly user listener participation type of show so if you want to give us a call 312-588-1200 love to hear from you love to hear from you now i will tell you that we are going to be abandoning the phone system and we're going to go over to a skype based system here soon soon because of the audio quality so why don't you guys kick the tires one last time 312-588-1200 love to hear from you it is open lines you can talk to me we can talk about whatever tickles your fancy so talking about bob lazar i am trying to get bob lazar on the show i know a couple people we've already had some pretty pretty good guests who know bob personally and what's really funny, this is no joke. I am not kidding you. My mother listens to the show, so I'm not going to tell you a lie. <laughs> I would tell you a lie if she wasn't listening to the show. But this is the honest God truth. Bob Lazar actually moved into the town that my cousin Jason lives. Uh, he, lis- he listens to the show as well moved into the same town and come to find out i did not know this he bought it's it's a long story and i wish it's crazy but he bought the house that my aunt's parents owned that they sold and moved when they moved to colorado yeah the guy was like living right next door to my cousin for for years and didn't even know it. And I didn't find out until I started doing research. And I saw the town. And then his house is now up for sale. And I'm like, wait a minute. That's my that's my cousin's grandparent. Yeah, it's, it's weird because it's second marriage or whatever. However that works. I'm like, that's their house. Because now he's, he's trying to sell it. And I think he's wanting to move back out to the Midwest. So the whole time, here I am, a big Bob Lazier fan. I mean... He was, I, I can't remember, let's let's go back and talk about our fondness. Here's a great topic. Here's a great topic as we wait for our guests to come on. What is your fondest Art Bell moment? What was your, when you listened to Art Bell, what was the show that made you just go fall in love with Art Bell? And I know all of you guys 
out there in the chat room know who Art Bell is. And if you don't, shame on you. <laughs> shame on you. But what was your favorite, your favorite Art Bell show? I will have to say my favorite one was the uh, Area 51 where the guy took the airplane and flew it, supposedly flew it into Area 51. And the whole time he's flying his airplane, he's talking to Art Bell. That was an incredible show. I I would have to say that was that was an incredible incredible show i was watching i was on the edge of my seat the whole time now i'm saying that if any of you guys want to go out to area 51 or s4 and you want to breach the the perimeter call me <laughs> phil you know call me that was it oh there you go link to news that was a great show, was it not, Link to News? I would replay it, but Art is pretty specific about, uh, he, he comes out, believe it or not, all of those shows out there, he's suing all those guys. <laughs> he's, yeah, he is uh, protecting us, though. I would not, I don't want to play his show, but uh, yeah, so he had a show on for those listeners out there, and you can go to YouTube, and you can, you know, I would say, I would probably Google or put in YouTube Art Bell Area 51 pilot call in and listen to it. It is just an amazing show. But getting back to that, if, if any of you guys want <laughs> to, to penetrate <laughs> the perimeter there at Area 51 S4 or any of those facilities and you want to call me, call me. I'll come and visit you in federal prison. I'll be your best friend. <laughs> I'll send you I'll send you care packages. <laughs> but please. But please feel feel free to give me a call. I'd love to <laughs> love to hear that one. But that was a great show. I I thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed that that show. And of course you had the you know the classic Mel Hole Mel's Hole uh, you know, Bob Lazar. The other one that kept me up that just freaked me out was the, uh, the, uh, ranch. Um, what do they call it? Shadow Ranch? I can't remember. Let me put it into the Googler here. But that was a George Knapp show. George was, was more of that. Um, He, uh, let me see here what it was, what they called it. Skinwalker, Skinwalker Ranch. That one was pretty, pretty eerie. Yeah, that one was pretty eerie. Those are the type of shows that we're trying to bring back here. Those are the type of things, uh, the crazier the better. When I talk to guests, they ask me, they say, well, how crazy shall I get? And I'm like, get as crazy as you want. Just keep it within reason. Now, caller, we, we're coming up on a hard break. I see you in the queue. I will definitely get to you. I don't want to bring you on the air just yet because uh, we are going to be going to a break in literally a few seconds here but when we get back from the break i will definitely bring you in the queue and we can have it's open lines tonight we can talk about your most craziest art bell story that you might have or any story that you might have i'd love to hear from you and as we wait for our very special guest manu itarami to join us on the show but you're listening to the Midnight Ocean Radio Show and Podcast. I am your host, Jeff Norton. You can join me live here every weeknight from 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or 24 by 7 at www.themidnightocean.com. 
This is the Midnight Ocean with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. Yes, it is. And, and talk about things under your bed. Yeah, as Right before we went off to the segment, I did actually hear from from our guest, Manu, 
into Rami. I got to keep on saying his name so I can pronounce it right. I got to keep it dwelled in my head. For those that know me know that I am horrible at names other than Bob. <laughs> you know, so, so, uh, Right before we went off the break, though, we were talking about classic Art Bell show. Y yeah, the classic Malachi, Father Malachi Martin. Wow. And you're after, I, 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 I cue that creepy up for you <laughs> there in the chat room talking about listening. That one, when he had the uh, gentleman, that, that, you know, the demon possession and the uh, EVPs. Remember the EVP lady? What was so cool about her? was they were just so mellow she'd be like yeah you know we had her take it you know it was her and a guy always and she would pull out the evp yeah we did this and and you get those are the ones when art would get upset when they would play the children the the children voices where you'd always hear them say oh my yeah <laughs> <laughs> that one yeah i i i think everybody here listened to art bell and for those that are out there listening if you never heard art bell there, there are plenty just go to youtube and type in art bell and it, it it's it, it's the, it, the shows are just prolific and everything. So if you guys want to give us a call, we have a new system that you can use. And it's Skype. We can kick the tires here as we're waiting for our guests to show up. Or you can give us a call at 312-588-1200 on the phone lines. But you can fill hundreds. That's incredible. Yeah. You know, one of the things, I, so so you guys know, when I did my political podcast, I stopped altogether. When I got back into doing podcasting, or when I was talked to come back on the air, I everybody thought I was going to go back to the old Jeff, the old politics. I reached out to Art Bell. I wrote him a letter. I I don't know if he ever got it. Uh, I did reach out to a guest that I had who was part of the Republican National there in Pahrump. So she actually was his neighbor. <laughs> so I reached out to her as well. And said, hey, look, ask Art one thing. What is the best advice that he could ever give to a podcaster or to someone who is wanting to do this business? And lo and behold, he, when he got back on the air, which he, he came out and he said the best, the advice, and I'm sure I'm not the only one to ask. That's a pretty generic question, right? To ask the master, the wizard, right? Of the midnight. The keeper of all things that go bump into the dark. But he replied on his show, he said, be yourself. He said, because if you're, if you're not yourself, you're fake, you're fraud, you're a phony. Be yourself. And I find that so true when I do these shows that I'm just myself. And we have great conversation. It works. Now, there was a time where I want, you know, you want to emulate the master, right? Students, all students do that. That's how you. That's how you learn. You start out Im imitating or emulating your mentor, and then you get confidence and you get your feet under you, and then you're off to the races, as they would say. And that was the thing. So. So when. When he said, be yourself, that, that was, that was a, a, you know, do your own show. Do your own show. And that stuck with me. And I've carried that through with this. And apparently we're doing something 
something great. Because we're only a month into into doing these shows and we're already being asked to go syndicate. Yeah. So doing something. And it's not just me, it's our great guests. And it's you the listeners that are contributing to the show. But like I said, we do have a new feature. If you don't want to call in, 312-588-1200. Love to hear from you until our guest shows up. If you want to help me kick the tires, this actually would, you guys could actually help us. Because it's hard for me to test these things because I don't have, it's all looped in here. So I can't call out and call back in with Skype and do a show. So we actually have created a new Skype line called TMO, TMO for The Midnight Ocean, TMO Listener, L-I-S-T-E-N-E-R. Give us a call. You can help us check out our sound quality with Skype. So that would be cool if you did that. So moving right along, our classic Art Bell shows. Remember the time travel, the Manhattan Project shows? Remember the the Manhattan the, that whole series, where they had the they had the first guy that came in and and talked about he was on the Manhattan the ship as they put it back in time, and then they had the Montauk project, right after that. Remember those shows? Those are the ones that would that would get you. Those were cool. Those were cool. Last night's show was pretty impressive. All of our shows have been pretty pretty impressive, I have to say. One thing I have to learn is I have to let my guests run with the show. Sherry, welcome. Sherry, welcome. I know this is your second time. But thank you. I know that you came in a little bit late, but we are waiting for our for our guest to, to show up. He is he, he did text me. He did text me, so we are, we are go. We we do have a countdown. So so Manu Itarami will be joining us here shortly, and it's all good. It's all good. Stuff happens. It's called life, right? Don't get uptight about it. I can sit here and chat with you guys all night long in the chat room. And if you'd like to join us on chat, the only chat room that we use on the show is on YouTube. So you can, folks, there's now, yeah, you know, that, that was pretty sad. And believe it or not, that does happen. So, so let me give you guys a little bit of history. So Art Bell obviously had Coast to Coast, which was taken over by George Norrie, sold. Art Bell, you know, in all fairness, I do know this. Art Bell sold that show. He he got a buttload of money. <laughs> you know, at any given time. So you so those that don't know that are listening, Art Bell had at any given time anywhere between eight and ten million listeners, and in some cases up to fifteen million listeners a night. He was larger than Rush Limbaugh and Howard Stern. Every night. George Norrie, I think they say, advertising-wise, he gets about 200,000 listeners a week. That's crazy. Went from 8 eight to 10 million on average, upwards of 10 million. So when Art Bell sold that, sold that off, and he sold it for a buttload of money. A lot of people don't know this. They think that he just wanted to retire and got out of it, and then George took it over. No, no, no. He sold it. So let's all be fair. So Art sold it and he, you know, he had some tragedy in his life. He had some issues. His, his first wife, is L- L- Ramona, 
the love of his life, she passed away from asthma as they were traveling. So rightfully so, man. I don't know anybody out there who could who could maintain after that. If anything happened to Sandy, I don't know what I would do. I don't know. I'd probably be on an island somewhere. Just take my boat and just fill it up with gas and drive it until it hit an island. <laughs> and whatever, right? So, so Art, you know, left, and then he came back to Sirius XM. Now, they had a lot of technical issues. Art, Art show is based on Colin, kind of like what hopefully our show will become. So I wish some of you guys would call in and participate. Join us on the new Skype line, TMO listener line. Or you can call us at 312-588-1200. So his show was based upon the call-in. He had the guest plus the call-in. And XM had a hard time with that. There were some issues. And so Art, unfortunately, left XM Radio. And, of course, he had a non-compete. So then he, he goes two years as a non-compete. Couldn't, couldn't do anything in the business. Without being sued. I think there were some other issues there too. Because no sooner that XM get rid of got rid of Art Bell, they moved coast to coast into his slot there at XM. So I'm sure there are some politics. It's things that we just don't know about. So then Art waited out his two years and, and him and, and you know long Keith Roland, his longtime webmaster, started up midnight in the desert that network and so art came back to the family i i was just i was i was happy i was so excited i was giddy <laughs> the master's back right the master's back and you know he did his show well apparently someone and i believe this this happened i have no reason to doubt this because i've had it with my political shows i'd have people show up it's inevitable that they're going to show up here. I will tell you this, though. This neighborhood where I live is highly patrolled by law enforcement. The sheriff substation is literally right down the street from me. My mother-in-law, <laughs> this is funny, my mother-in-law was sitting there this weekend putting a tarp in the, they had a truck. We had a, a china cabinet. My oldest daughter moved back to North Carolina. So she was putting a tarp over a piece of furniture in the back of the truck. The sheriff <laughs> proceeded to, to give her the what for. Who are you? What are you doing? Never seen you in this neighborhood. Why are you parked in this driveway? This is my mother-in-law. Who, by the way... They're the ones that built the house <laughs> before us. We, we bought the house from our from our in-laws. So it was kind of funny. She was laughing. She's like, wow, you got paid security. And we do. We do. You can't drive. When, I, when I'm doing this show, I can tell you right now, and I'm not going to tell you where they're at, but I can tell you the sheriff is parked right down the street waiting. Because we all know what happened to Art Bell. He also, it, it's funny because the sheriff actually was a fan of Art Bell. And he would listen to him. And, and what, what happened was, is, for all you guys that don't know, is Art, when he started doing his show, he started having death threats. People started threatening him. And it, it happens. It happens. You get knuckleheads everywhere. Well, apparently, someone then decided, well, they thought it was funny they would actually, he had a studio that was separate from his house. He actually did a show from his house. So what would happen was, is that he actually caught someone outside his studio one night. Almost shot the guy. He had his gun. Almost shot the dude. But the guy got away. Well, then a week later, Art is walking back to his studio and someone is taking pot shots at him. That's pretty serious stuff. When people, you know, it's all fun and games until someone tries to shoot you, right? It's pretty serious stuff. 
So, checking my text messages here. I'm getting messages. So, uh, and it's from our guest. I'm not texting <laughs> anybody else. So, you know, someone starts shooting at them. So, naturally, you, you got to think what's more important. The safety of your family. And he said it wasn't really the fact that he was laying in the dirt for an hour waiting for the sheriff to show up because they're pretty rural. But the problem was is that after after the sheriff cleared, and there, there are police reports. People say, oh, there's no police report. There are police reports. There was a, there was a, a press release made by the, by the Nye County Sheriff's Department. But as he goes in, to his house, his young daughter is cowered in the corner, just tearful. See, unless you have children and you experience that, you you know you don't know what you're going to do when your kids are in, in that kind of jeopardy. So I, you know, he made the decision that was best for his family, so he went off the air. Yeah, was I upset? Yeah, I was sad. I was. I, I, I missed the guy. I have, a, like you in the chat room, we all have very fond memories. If you were listening to Art Bell as you were going to college, I worked the graveyard shift. And when I would travel to the hospital and back from the hospital, uh, that's when I, when I was married, my first marriage, I listened to Art Bell. That's how I, you know, stayed awake, driving to work. And, and, and as I was working at the hospital, and then I would go to school. So a lot of us have those fond memories of him and his show, and we hate to see him leave, but he had to make the right decision. So the, the question was, and, and this is kind of, this is a, a good story, because I was sitting there, people were trying to get me back into the business of doing podcasts and getting me back into doing a show, and Art went off the air. And I said to myself, I'm like, well, I miss that. I miss those shows. I miss art, and I, but I miss those shows. Maybe that was the signal for me. And if you guys listened to my earlier show where I had a dream interpreter on, that night I had a dream about standing outside of the NAB, the National Association of Broadcasters, in, in downtown Chicago radio broadcasters and I was kind of like whoa this is weird and I talked to some friends and I talked to some very close friends of mine and the next thing I know sound boards are showing up equipment starts showing up to my house so it, it was kind of art goes off the air the thing and then I was like well I will never get the guests that Art had. I'll, I'll never be able to, These guys aren't going to give me the time of day. Well, lo and behold, we have some of the top guests, and we're getting more. If you guys go out to our, our website, themidnightocean.com, and in the bottom right-hand corner, you got the guests. Now, I will have to say that I'd like to take credit for it, but no. My daughter stepped up to the plate, Carly Norton, who's in the chat room. I just saw her pop in. Hey, Carly. And yes, that's my daughter. And yes, she is single, but she's not interested. <laughs> All you guys in the chat room. Dad is putting down the foot. But no. The thing is, is that uh, Carly reached out to, the, to these guests. And lo and behold, they started signing up. Now, you got to remember, you want to talk about taking a leap of faith. We didn't even have the show running yet. Didn't have our first show in the, in, in the, in the can, as they would say. And we already had named people showing up for the show, wanting to do the show. I have people now calling me saying, hey, look, I want to be on your show. I heard from so-and-so. I heard from so-and-so. We're going to have in the next coming months, What it, right now, 
it's a really busy time for production people. A lot of people that do production work and and everything. So, you know, it's working between people's production schedules. This is the time of year where, you know, shows are being shot and and they're getting edited and everything. So, but we're going to have, I, mean, I got a list of all those people. If everybody that was on Coast to Coast or any of those shows, I can tell you they're going to be on our show. Now, our format, I will tell you this too. And I'm not bragging, but I'm just saying, I am being told that our show, they love our show. And the reason being is because the way we're structured and the fact that we give each of our guests about 25 minutes. So, so you get, like I said, we go to break at 25, we start break, 26 after, and 56 after. So that gives the, the guests the whole time to talk uninterrupted. Uninterrupted. They love our. They love the format of our show, and they're recommending that. That's what's really cool. They're recommending their friends, people that they do, that they know, to our show. So it's growing. It's snowballing, and you know it's incredible. And that's how we got started into this into this whole thing. It was Art Bell left. There was a void. Someone needed to fill it. So I took my talents. Talents on loan from God. <laughs> That's Russell and Ball would say. And we applied it. And with a little bit of a help from, from Carly and some other individuals, we we were growing the show. I every guest that we have on this show, we I do have some that reach out to me directly now because they're doing it. But I will tell you, hats off to Carly. She's the one that reaches out to them. And she's the one that, that brings them brings them to us. So, hats off. She's out there in the... She's out there in the chat room. So, we're growing this. And like I said, today, for those that don't know, we are in negotiations with the syndicator. Yeah, that's <laughs> pretty impressive. We already have the you know the deal. The deal is is that we have to find a home radio station. We have to get one radio station. So we are actively going to be doing that tomorrow. <laughs> we will be calling <laughs> radio stations. Yeah. You have to we have to have a home base. And so if you know of a radio station in your area, even though we do broadcast out of the great state of Florida, but we this is all virtual. If you know of a great station that you think an AM station, an FM station, it doesn't matter. We just have to have that one. It's kind of a requirement. And uh, yeah, we'll get it. We'll get it, and uh, then it's off to the races. But that's how we got started in all of this. And I promise you that no matter what happens and what direction we take this show, it will always be free. That was one thing that irked me about Coast and a lot of the other shows. There's a lot of great shows out there, but they all want to charge for the downloads. And so you guys know it doesn't cost but maybe a hundred dollars a month for us to provide free downloads for you guys. So I don't know. I think it was a gimmick. Well, there's the music. We're going to take another break. I did get a text message from our guest, Manu Itarami. He will be joining us. He's having, he's having a, a moment right now. <laughs> he has a, a small, a small crisis and if you ever misplaced something i.e. keys <laughs> you know that that would be you know he, he's, he, he had to take care of some business apparently he, he forgot his keys or lost his keys so he has no way of getting home <laughs> so 
he's dealing with that, but we'll 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 get. This is the break. Midnight Ocean with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. Night Ocean with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. right andrew this is the midnight ocean radio show and i guess i'm your host uh, jeff norton you can join me live here every weeknight from 10 p.m till 2 a.m eastern standard time for the time being 
for the time being, we are going to go to a five-hour show. <laughs> That's right, five hours, because four is just not enough. <laughs> no, we're going to a five-hour show because that is what the radio stations demand of us, and uh, so we can go competitive. We're going to go right up against from 12 until 5 a.m. live, and uh, it's going to be good times. We're going to be here for a little bit, though. Don't think that we're going to be changing up the schedule anytime soon. But we will be changing it up never, nevertheless. But the good news is, is like I said, you can always hear us, uh, download us every day. I promise you. We will, we will let the radio stations do what they want to do, and we will do what we want to do. And you will always be able to download our shows, and we will always do some type of YouTube. If YouTube goes away, we'll go back to Twitch. There are, there are ways. There are ways. I really like this format. One of the things, hopefully, when our guest <laughs> does join up, and like I said, he is he's having a little crisis, and anybody who has lost keys, have you ever been somewhere in your car and or been somewhere doing business and you misplace your keys and you realize that you're stuck <laughs> at wherever you're at? So that is what's going on so Manu Interami is going to be joining us eventually eventually stuff happens we have to over overcome adapt and overcome and it's all good no worries there yeah it is Sherry in the chat room says that's a lot of hours it is a lot of hours but that's what we have to do if we want to grow this, if we want to get the message out and offer the great programming that we want to offer, you know, the show, past shows that we did, you know, the Brad Olsons of the world, the Leo Zagamis of the world, you know, Thornhill, Walt Thornhill, all of our guests. I can go down the whole list. And actually, since we changed our website over, there's about 20 guests I have not put on the website yet. I still got to get their back, them back up and running. I can tell you, if we want to get those out there, we have to compete. And that's what the radio stations want from us. That's what we'll give them. That's, you know, it's your job. It's my job. Who's... Who's Midnight here in the chat? I don't know. Who is Midnight? Oh, the Midnight Ocean? That's me, Sherry. That's uh, that's Jeff Norton. You're talking to me. <laughs> that's funny. I'm, I'm in the chat room talking. You know, maybe what we ought to do is take the chat room and post it on the, on the pages. We're, now... You know what? If you want to see what's going on in the chat room, you need to go to the chat room. This is a listener participation show. And we encourage, and I will always, always communicate with our callers. I'm going to talk about communicate with our with our callers. I think we have... Norton. <laughs> Sir, Manu, what's are you up, there? <laughs> I'm Dude, sorry, guys. No, no, no worries, man. You find your, you find your keys. <laughs> no, dude, I lost them. You lost I them. Completely lost my keys. I'm <laughs> out there taking headshots with the photographer, and so, and I'm in a suit, and I'm like, you know, dressed to the nines, so I don't yeah. want keys in my pocket. So every yeah. different location we go to, I'm tossing my keys, and I f just forgot to pick them up at one of those places, and I went back to everywhere, but nada. Oh wow, that sucks, man. How'd you get? I mean, how'd you get home? I walked home, and luckily there's a spare set of keys to the to the house. But the keys to the car are gone, and the keys uh, to my mailbox and oh crap! Uh, you know, life could be worse, but it's a drag. It's right. <laughs> well, when you you know when you come home tomorrow and you got someone laying in your bed, don't just call the police. 
<laughs> I think something fishy's going on. That's for sure. I think something fishy's going on. Well, are, were you the only one doing the headshot, or were some were, were some other guys with you? Some of the other guys. There were two females, both of which I don't trust. So oh. I, I don't know what the fuck. So mean. I mean, yeah. what the hell? Yeah. Well, it's funny because. Yeah. Uh, well, I, yeah, I was watching your video, and it seems like you guys are a bunch of pranksters amongst each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I, you know, that's what I was. I didn't know about the girls, but you know, I, that's another. Hey, hey, to each their own. Good for you. <laughs> no, what you're saying, you, yeah, you, uh, a little shady, right? Hey, I, yeah, you got to be careful these days, man. Be I'm careful. guessing either. You- aliens took him or or somebody just picked him up and you know did something like put them in their apartment complexes yeah. mailbox or something i don't know yeah well I'm, I'm sorry to hear that but uh i'm glad you were able to join us and i know that you're you're limited on time so i didn't even get to do the intro because i just doing, saw you pop yeah, in. i'm decent on time now that i lost my keys because i can't go anywhere oh you can't <laughs> well i thought you had a buddy that was coming to get you that's cool all right then hey we'll just we'll just we'll just take the rest of your evening yeah <laughs> and if i hear and if i hear you screaming then i know someone's brought out I'll, I'll call the proper authorities yeah please do <laughs> yeah, no i'll take care of you man all right. it's, it's all about it's all about love so I didn't get to do a proper, you know, I just saw you pop in, so I just hit the button. I didn't do a proper intro and okay. everything. But uh, for those that don't know, look, I'm not going to do it. People know this about me. I'm not doing their homework. I posted your name on there. If they want to know who you are, just Google you, right? <laughs> yeah, and if you don't know me and you're listening, my name is Manu Reme. I'm an actor, producer. Uh, most people know me from Star Trek Voyager. I played the character Echeb. I uh, also re- resurrected him like 12 years later in Renegades, the uh, online series. Yeah. And I was also Billy in One Tree Hill. And beyond that, you can just look up Monuente Reme and there's a bunch of movies and, and stuff that I've produced and made. Exactly. Ex- ex- there you go. I just I should yeah. just have guests do their own intros. <laughs> it, yeah. makes, it makes my life easier. I don't have to worry about mispronouncing their names. I'm an actor. I'm a singer. I'm a dancer. And I've seen a bear once. <laughs> Talk about that. We've seen a ton of bears here in Florida. You got to come here. Jesus. I've seen more bears. I've seen a bear more than once now that I... I've seen a lot of bears, too. I I, I don't know why I said once. Yeah. I'm 38 years old. I've seen more than one bear. (laughs) I've been around. In the wild, though. How many bears in the wild have you seen? Uh, Well, at least like four or five at Yosemite. And then I saw one in the wild in Alaska that was pretty cool. Big, big bear. Yeah. It's... uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen bears. Unfortunately, when I was out in in my in my caveman days, and thought that killing animals was cool and for sport, I, I will tell you, I, I've changed those ways. I don't do that anymore. Have you killed a bear? Yeah, yeah. I had wow. a buddy. I had a buddy take me out on a trip and and with a bow. I didn't do it with a gun. And and the cool thing about it was, I guess this thing. I'm a fat man, so most of the guys that hunt bears like climb trees. Yeah. yeah. No, I did it from a ground blind. No way with a bow with and a, arrow. With a bow and arrow, yeah. I wanted to make it challenging. I wanted to make, you know, at least for the animal, if I didn't get it, it was going to get me. I was going to be like that Geico commercial with the fish. I was going to be hanging on its wall. <laughs> <laughs> was so. it Was it a decent size, like a yeah, big bear? It was, it was about a 400-pound bear, black bear. Okay, yeah. so it could have kicked your ass. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It def- well, yeah I, I, I had, a, you know, yeah, it, was, it would have been a fair fight. You didn't like shoot a baby bear in the head no, with a bone. No, I don't. no there's rules. There's there's rules. I mean, even <laughs> even you know, believe it or not, the, and like I said, I don't do that anymore. So all the, all those guys out there, I just don't. I I it's funny because I thought it would be cool to hunt a bear, mm-hmm. and then after doing it, I felt so bad about it. I was like, this yeah, is, yeah, this is horrible. Was that what was was that like your defining moment of yeah. not? Uh, no hunting more. things anymore never the and, and you're talking to a guy who's an avid hunter that was I, well i never really gun hunt i was always a bow hunter and yeah and after that i just said no more i just I, for some you, you have these epiphanies these moments in life where you just grow up yeah and, and you know for me it wasn't like i was putting food on my tail now i i want to say this people i know there's a lot of hunters that put you know that have to hunt to offset because they're you know that's how they they put food on their table and that's okay 
I, yeah. I'm not, you know, I, I, I can go if I want, if I want meat, I just go to the McDonald's or something. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, actually, there's go. this new sort of uh, movement in the, the, in, the, in the cities, New York and L.A. and other cities. And I think it's a pretty conscious movement because it's, it's city folk that have never hunted, never done anything, never killed an animal, yeah. yet they've eaten meat their whole lives like crazy, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's something to do with the conscious choice of going out into the wild and hunting. And actually, you go with like a, a, a hunter that, that knows what they're doing. And you kill your own deer and you cut it up and you eat every single bit of it. Like that's what you have to do if you want to join this club. Yeah. And so you have a conscious, you get to experience the what it truly means to, to consciously kill and eat your meat. Yeah. And I think a lot of people that do it don't get addicted to it. In fact, they go the opposite way, and they yeah. go, "Wow, that's that's a little heavy." Like when you when you actually do the killing and take responsibility for it, it's a little bit different than than uh, just you know ordering a steak. Exactly, you're you're absolutely right. And and yeah. actually, we're getting to the point now where you know we're meat eater, we're carnivores here at the at the Norton household. But I'm mm -hmm. getting to the point now where I'm just like, yeah. I, I'm probably going to switch just to plain vegetarian. I'm the same way. I'm a I'm a vegetarian at heart that can't seem to stop eating meat. Yeah. I I, I um, but one day I think I'm going to make the transition, and I I sort of have uh, gone halfway there. But then all of a sudden I'll be at a nice steakhouse, and I'll be like, Yeah, right. I'm yeah, getting I gotta, a steak. Yeah, I got to have the steak. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that's the same way with me. I, I mean, it, it, it's all. It, you know what I hate? Because I'm a fat man. And when I go to a restaurant, I like salads. And, hey, salads I'll, and look, I'll tell you, I'm I'm on no diet. I don't diet. The way I look at it, life, I, you know, I watch relatives miserable, miserable. I would rather die fat than miserable. And No, no doubt. Yeah, and I've had, I've seen relatives who have just been, you know, on a diet, miserable, hating life, hating everything. And I just refuse to do that. But I'll go to a restaurant and I'll order a salad because I like salads. And people will be like, oh, you're on a diet. It's like, no, I'm not fat man eating salad. doesn't mean you're on a diet. It just means I, I like to eat. <laughs> I like to eat salad. <laughs> you know? But it, it's just, I don't know. I, enough about me. Let's talk about you for a while. Yeah. And, uh, hey, man, I saw, I know you didn't listen to last night's show. I, I know you didn't because I know you have other things to do than listen to my shows. But I watched your circuit, um, the on the circuit. We've been promoting that the the Facebook page here on the show before you got here, and that episode where you're doing the Pokemon <laughs> is hilarious. It's, it's pretty funny. It is. It is so funny. Who are the two actors? And then I know one of them. Uh, it's. Rush? It's Armin Shimmerman from Deep Space Nine and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He played Principal Snyder on Buffy the Vampire yeah. Slayer, and on um, uh, he played Quark on Deep Space Nine. Yeah, and it's uh, Tim Russ who played Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager, and uh, Principal what? On, he, they're both principals. I Carly, he's 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 the principal on I Carly too. If you like that kid show yeah. for, for the kids out there, um, the Nickelodeon show. Uh, but they're hilarious, and it's just funny watching the the two old Star Trek guys. Uh, you know, just quote, in, just the fact that they know about the game and they know which which characters are important, yeah. and uh, it's pretty funny. Yeah, they're running and, you, they're running you around. And well, you know what yeah. made me what made me laugh is I had Linda Zimmerman on, and she she did the Hudson Valley UFO story. She actually did. The, there was a movie that was done out of that called Into the Night. Of, uh, uh, a cans movie that came out of that and she was on last night and what was hilarious is she told a story about a lady who was abducted yeah check this out so this lady uh -huh. was abducted she gets up in the morning her husband's a science teacher and she goes honey i was abducted last night he goes you're freaking out of your mind and she goes no i was abducted by aliens last night and so she he goes outside and everything because they said they took her through the window. So he goes outside and he comes running back in the house. He's like, call the police, call the police. And apparently they had this big sand pile because they were doing some construction on their house. Uh -huh. And whoever abducted this lady just flattened 
<laughs> this sand pile. Basically landed their, their craft on it, and there's pictures of it. And oh, so, wow. so I'm watching your video, and I'm like, if I was an alien, I'd be messing with people. I oh, mean, absolutely. I, I would not be a me? human or, eating or dominating or city blowing up alien. I would be like, I'm going to mess with your head, alien. You know, I'm look, these guys have been messing with their heads forever. If you if you read any of the literature, you go back to like even uh, Mothman prophecies, like yeah. back in the 50s and the 60s. Where do they show up? You know, they don't show up in their major city and yeah. like they, they show up in the middle of nowhere in the Mothman prophecies, it's somewhere in North America, small town. Uh, I can't remember the name of the place, but at that time, if you if you rem- if you read that book, the, everybody in town was seeing not only the Mothman, but they were seeing UFOs, yeah, but- they were seeing strange lights, they were seeing all sorts of stuff, and they were also seeing Men in Black. And these Men in Black were very weird. Uh, like there's like 35 reports of this is what, some of the first times that people start seeing Men in Black. And um, the guy, the men in black are very strange. They come to your house. They're driving like 1920s uh, automobiles. Yeah. They're dressed in black. They've got permagrins on their face. Mm-hmm. Uh, they come into your house and they just can't stop smiling at you. And they're and they tell you basically, hey, you didn't see what you think you, what what you thought you saw last night. Yeah. Uh, you probably shouldn't tell anybody about that. And then. They're doing weird things in your house, like they're picking up your forks or stealing pens because they're interested in them. You know that that's an alien who just got his first human suit, and they're testing it out, and it's a little funky because it smiles all the time. And and they've gotten better. And I just think, you know, back then, they were weird men in black that smiled all the time. Now they probably look just like us. They probably got the human suits figured out. And they're probably hanging around with us all the time and messing with us. Yeah, I, I would be. Like I said, I, and I, I, we're going to do a poll. Like, if you were an alien, what kind of would you be a humanoid eating, a, a city destroying, or would you be a messing with the, you know, like messing with Sasquatch, messing with the humans? I, I would be that guy. Well, and just think, supposedly, this is my second argument to, of course, they're going to mess with us because it's fun. The second argument is they're interdimensionals. A lot of people think they're interdimensionals. These crafts can pop into one dimension, pop out of the other. So if I had the ability to travel between dimensions, meaning that if I was in one apartment building and I could go into the other dimension that's invisible from my own, but yet still look at myself, I'm going to mess with myself. <laughs> I'm going to take, I'm gonna like, take, I'm know, gonna take my keys. Neighbors. Yeah, I'm going to take my own keys. <laughs> that's probably what happened. <laughs> My interdimensional alien self from like 10,000 years from the future is just screwing with me because he can. Yeah, because he can. He's like, yeah, I'll, I'll show him. I'm going to take his uh-huh. <laughs> That's funny. I, that's why I think ghosts are just laughing at you too. My grandma, every once in a while, she, she died when I was like nine. Every once in a while, a couple times a year, I'll just hear the word, hey, and I'll see my grandma in my mind. And it'll be like three o'clock in the morning. I'll be like getting up to take a pee or get something to eat. Yeah. And behind me, I'll hear a, hey, and I'll see my grandma in my head for a second. And it's really creepy. And she has kind of a smile on her face. And I know it's just grandma screwing with me. Yeah, mess with I'm you. just like, God, would you stop it, grandma? Quit it. <laughs> now, did you, obviously with, with your name, you probably have a pretty eclectic family. Oh, yeah. Um, you can't be an Irish white boy Manu and Tereme without having hippie parents. <laughs> exactly. So you probably have a, you, you know, your family is, is has a propensity. Of, see, see, my dad, it, my, it, you know, one of my family members died would be like, hey, jackass. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what I would do. I would do is get up, you lazy bum. <laughs> go, yeah. go, go to work. <laughs> you go know, to work. I hear it now. I mean, they're still alive, and I hear you. You want to do what? <laughs> you, <laughs> go to work. Go to go. Yeah, I, I hear it now on the phone. I go to work. Yeah. <laughs> Stop being a bum. There's no. No, future, yeah. I mean, no my parents were full on, uh, full on loony birds, and they still are. I mean, my mother was the first person to see an alien in my family. She was, she was right back about. A couple years before that Whitley Strieber book came out. Oh yeah, Confession. we were living in northern Idaho, up in the middle of nowhere, way out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. 
And uh, I was like four, three or four years old, and I, I used to feel these things crawl across me at night. And they were like little blue guys. I could, I never looked at them, but in my head, every 43 minutes, they would come up through my window and crawl across me and they would go around my house in a pattern. We had a really big house. And somehow in my head, I could tell when they were coming in the window. Oh, wow. So I would scream at my parents to let me sleep with them. I was scared of these guys crawling in my windows. My parents gave me no time of day. But then my mom, a couple of years later, she's sleeping. And she turns over on her left-hand side, and she sees what today we would call a gray. Uh, at the time, we didn't have uh, a name for him. And she said it was very ethereal, like she could almost see through it. But it had the big black eyes and the slit nose and the, the slit for the mouth. And she said it kind of just like did a, a Stevie Wonder. You know how he kind of shakes <laughs> back and forth? Yeah. And it was kind of Stevie Wonder in by her bed. And she was half awake, so she was so she, and, and and kind of just not with it. And it was she said it was very cat like, mm -hmm. and so she she thought she was just like half and half awake, half asleep. And she goes, "Hey, magic, you look weird." And then she rolled over, thinking that it was our cat. And then the cat's laying in the middle of the bed. So then she, you know, ice chills went up her back, and yeah. she went, "Well, what's behind me then?" Yeah. And she turned around, and when she turned around, it was gone. She heard a outside the house, saw blue light flash around her room, and then the thing was gone. And she then went to do like the whole past life regression yeah. stuff and said she's been seeing them since she was a little kid. And then two years later, that book came out, Communion, Communion. and she was in the library and saw that cover. I don't know if you remember the cover to Communion, but oh, yeah. that was – the first time we saw the the, the gray uh, image uh, that we, you know, really got imprinted into the social mind con construct or whatever. Um, she said she was like floored in the library when she saw it. And then she brought it home and, and I was, it, it gave me a really eerie feeling. But I, I suppose it does that to everybody because it's pretty wild painting. Yeah, no, it it, it definitely is. Is, yeah. is crazy. Actually, Linda was Linda Zimmerman was on last night. Uh, she knows Whitley, so I'm gonna I'm trying to parlay that conversation to see if we can get Whitley on here because uh, yeah, you know he awesome. took a pretty pretty big hit. You know, a lot of people made fun of you know South Park and those guys. Kinda, yeah, you know, I mean, but here's a guy who's just, that's their job. They make fun of weirdos. Yeah. I, mean, you know. I mean, well, they're 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 the ultimate trolls, right? And yeah. they and they're and, it's entertainment. Yeah, I love the South Park guys. I don't think they mean any harm. They just like making jokes. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I get it. I mean, we do, but I would dig to talk to them. I'd just be, I'd, I'd be more happy to talk to Whitley than the South Park guys. But I'd like to talk to them too. <laughs> well, yeah, everybody's, everybody's got a story to tell. I mean, that's the thing is, but they, you know, unfortunately, Whitley kind of took it to heart, and he's kind of fallen off the face of the earth in the sense that he, you know, he feels that like he's been attacked for, for sharing that part of his life and, and and for those that haven't read communion you need to read it because it, it's pretty detailed it, it'll scare the crap out of you <laughs> yeah to, to I, I, I you. think there's definitely people dealing with interdimensionals i think i think aliens have been watching the earth for god knows how long yep. but the, the the reason that i believe it the the most uh is because of just all the military f uh, footage and military encounters yeah. all across the world with jets and uh, military folks. I tend to like trust that they're not just making a story up. And not only that, but the, there's the photographic evidence is uh, if you read uh, Leslie Keene's book, um, Militaries, uh, what is it called? I forget what it's called, but it's basically all the military uh, stuff that's been unclassified i mean those crafts are not ours they and if they are ours that's pretty damn cool but yeah yeah um you know either we have some really sophisticated technology that we've been hiding from the public for a long time or we're working with them or they're they're just keeping an eye on us to check out what we're doing no i i i agree with you I, you know we i was sitting with brad olson you know and he wrote the eccentric books and He's pretty well connected, you know. He's been working on the with History Channel and 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 those guys and, and that series. You know, History Channel actually had a I, well, I watched it last night. I don't know when it actually aired, but they talked about the moon actually being hollow 
and being a, 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 a observatory for aliens. And I did not know this, but uh, when they shot, apparently the theory about the moon being hollow was when they shot the, uh, the lander back at the moon, it rang. It literally rang for several hours or for several minutes. And then, then NASA, and to this day, they don't know why, why it rang, but uh, they wanted to do another test. So they shot a bigger rocket at it and it rang, that one rang for several hours. Uh, wow. And, like a bell. They, and, and NASA, uh, I never heard of that. I watched the show last night and they actually had scientists from NASA said, yeah, it rang like a bell. So, well, it's a perfect place to park, right? And we we yeah. never see the backside, do we? I mean, no. I'm not an astronomer, but I don't no, think we you ever, never see, see, the you, so, you never see the backside. So, what well, a perfect place to park, man! I mean, that's yep. where I'd park. Yeah, if you're going to observe, exactly, you're going to sit huh. in the backside and watch. And they, you know, and then there's the theory. It was a, it was a fascinating. Uh, it was on the History Channel. It was called Ancient Aliens. That series. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, Brad Brad's involved with that, and he was telling me about it, so I I started to watch it. And it was just incredible, these guys. And these are these are guys that are, you know, have PhDs after their name said, yeah, the the moon is you know the only the only way that the moon could do that is it be hollow. One of the other tell, and I didn't know this until watching the show. I did the show, and then I watched that show. So I was up until about six in the morning. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the crater of the moon, all of the craters are the same depth. No way. Yeah. They're all the same depth. So they're saying there's something solid under the earth. And then if you also look at the craters, there's in the center of the crater where you would think that it would indent in, you're actually seeing the, the object that hit the, the moon. You're seeing mm -hmm. part of that object. They said it, from a physics standpoint, that is impossible, but it doesn't matter the crater or it doesn't matter the size of the object. If you look at all of the craters, they all have the same depth. Which means that they're hitting something solid. They're they're like going and then hitting something real solid. And they're they're saying the moon is. You know, a lot of the theorists out there are saying the moon's hollow. It's metal, and then it has a coating. Basically, it has moon moon dust, which is made of. And they they did the sample. Most of the moon dust samples are like chromium, and they're metallic. Yeah. The sample, the moon, you know, dirt is is not actually dirt. It's metal. Or yeah, more. and we have no really real concept of how that thing got made and how it got. Uh, made. Yeah, I mean, I saw. I think I saw a, a program where they, the theory was that back in the day when, when things were chaotic, a big chunk of Earth got flung out there. But yeah. uh, I don't know. I, I just think it would be a good place to park. And if right. I was an alien, that's where I would park. And gonna, I, I also think that we have some incredible facilities up there that, you know, our black ops yeah. super secret government doesn't talk about either. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, and, you know, I think it's crazy. To me, it's like the the official story to me is just, to me, it's crazy. We, we went up there 50-something years ago. Or, I mean, it, and haven't been now, back since. And we haven't been back since. Yeah, right. Yeah. Come on, we've been. That, that just that doesn't make sense to me. I, I think, I think the shuttle has been the, uh, and I could be wrong about all this stuff because I'm not a smart guy. But I think the shuttle, be, it being retired just recently, is it, proof that like we've got something way better. And we've had something way better for a long time. And the shuttle has just been kind of, you know, what they let us watch and keep interested in. Well, I think, you know, just, I mean, if you go back and look at the SR-71 and some of those incredible ships that were flying in the 50s, those things were getting pretty damn close to being able to pull up and, and get out of the atmosphere. Yeah. And I can't imagine that 60-something years later with, with how technology develops that we don't have something that can just take off now, uh, especially in the trillion, multi-trillion dollar black ops world that really is how, you know, secret projects and all that is is got three more times the budget than the, the, the white ops, like uh, stuff that we the public gets told about. Yep. 
So I sure would like to join that club, man. I'm just putting the call out there. <laughs> if anybody needs any extra hands out there in the super secret ops, black ops club, I, I, I'm down, down to sign the, the, whatever I got to sign the, <laughs> the devil, you know, the, the devil, my soul, I'll give the devil my soul. I'll sign in blood, whatever I got to do to you join want, the club. You, you just want to know about it, right? I, yeah, I just want to ride on one of those ships, man. I, and and I, I want in on the... I just want in, man. Those guys seem to be... Uh, I, yeah, I want to be a part of the secret world. The the, the regular world's pretty boring. If, yeah, if you think about it, yeah, you get up and go to work, right? <laughs> yeah, and I, and I don't think I... You know, I, they, you guys, if you're out there, you got nothing to worry about with me. I, I don't really like my friends too much. I, I don't care about my family. I, I, I'll sacrifice them. Whatever it takes. <laughs> I I I, I want to be a part of the club. You want to so, be part of the club. Yeah. See, I don't want to be do. part of the club. I I, yeah. I I I was nowhere near part of that club. But when in my software writing days, I I own pat some patents, and uh, some mm-hmm. of my patents are being used by certain in indi- certain groups, and I had the opportunity to go work for them, and and I just said no. I have no desire. I, you know, I just have fun, guys. I, I just, I wrote it on, it was a challenge. I wanted to see if I could do it. I did it and have a nice day. And, yeah. And uh, and that's all you can say about it? Is it weapon stuff or? or no, it air- was, uh, no, you can look up the patent. I, I actually wrote the, uh, you can, you can put in Jeff Norton and you can type in patents and mm-hmm. you will see two that I wrote that are being used. I can, my first patent was I, when you talk on the telephone, Mm -hmm. I, or, or the government knows it's you versus me talking. Ah, Got it. So that's patent number one. And then patent number two is a data algorithm, compression algorithm, because you have vast amounts of data that is associated with that type of product. And, uh, it's, uh, it's a way of, ciphering through large quantities of data very quickly so so it's basically uh, partially your fault that we're being spied on and they know everything about uh you know what's, we're real, doing. You know what's really funny i wrote the software for the home health care industry one of the areas that is huge in fraud huge in fraud is that you'll have a home health care nurse or, or not a nurse but you'll have like a, a an assistant go mm-hmm. to grandma's house to take care of her and they'll they'll go they'll take care of her but then they charge for an rn they say it like a registered nurse which is a different billing rate right i mean we we eliminated you know hundreds of millions of dollars of fraud and at the state level for medicare medicaid fraud so that's what originally the software was for so you would be a nurse or whoever you'd go to the house you'd call in say you're there and then when you were done, you'd call out and you say, we're there. And we had a way, I built an algorithm that that verified that that was you that called in and it wasn't someone calling in acting like you. And, well, needless to say, uh, that was that technology, once we filed the patents for it, that technology was sucked up pretty quickly. And I was offered a job. I was, I was literally said, hey, you can come work for us. And I said, nope, I have no desire to work for you guys. Don't want anything to do with it. Uh, I can see like where this the is going. Homeland Security sort of for, sort of sort of folk. Hey, it was yeah, it was before Homeland Security. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was yeah. I mean, you can imagine. I mean, we, we I've heard stories that has been used to you know catch and track certain people down when they when they when agencies hear them on the phone and know it's them, then they yeah then they can figure out where they are and they go get them or they send a drone and. Yeah, I'm just saying whatever I got to do. Uh, yeah. Abduct babies, uh, you know, kill um, uh, women and children. Whatever I got to do. You're, 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 that's all for you. That's awesome. Want to be in the secret club. You want to be. You want to know the secret handshakes. Yeah, take me up to the Bohemian Grove. I'll worship the owl. Uh, I'll, 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 you know, sacrifice care. I'm surprised. Uh, you know. now, 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 see, you're going to lead into an area here, and I'm going to start asking the questions now. <laughs> <laughs> I am surprised in what you do and your 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 background and the fact that who you are, that you yeah. have not been asked to drink the Kool-Aid or go up the Bohemian Grove. 
I, I'm Me just, I'm either. Shocked. I've been completely bummed out that it hasn't happened at this point. I, I figured, I was really hoping when I got on Star Trek that that I was like, okay, I'm getting yeah. into the studio system. These guys got the money. They're doing the space show. Maybe these guys are nothing. Nada. Really? No. No, here we're going to offer you a show, and all you have to do to join the one percenters is offer us your brother, or your sister, or your mother, and none, none of that stuff, man. Not yet. But um, you know it goes on, right? You're, well, yeah, you're... I've heard. Uh, I've heard that it does. Uh, you know, there's all that stuff about if you're, you know, Kanye giving away his mom, and yeah. and uh, you know, and and I've. I've actually talked to some people that I, you know, I'm pretty sure that it has happened to. You know, I, I really like that guy, Dave Chappelle. Mm-hmm. And and Dave Chappelle really hasn't talked about it, but in in nothing but vague references. When he did his show and then he was offered that multi-billion dollar deal and freaked out and ran to Africa for a while. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, what? Well- uh, I think, you know, they basically, the, the Hollywood Satanists or, you know, uh, elite uh, offered him something for something that creeped him out. And he was like, I ain't into this and, and, and ran. And then he really hasn't been about since. And he was the, you know, he was the biggest hit in comedy. Yeah. And I think most people, uh, just knowing myself, I mean, I... I most people, I think, uh, w- are willing in this decadent uh, American, uh, you know, uh, super rich system to drink the Kool Aid and take oh. the deal. I-, I know I would. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. I got criticized when I people were like, "Here you are eating Roman noodles in downtown Chicago, scratching by, trying to make a living, pay child support, and you could have had the whole kit and caboodle." Yeah, <laughs> they're like you probably could have had your ex-wife eliminated if you want. <laughs> and I'm not yeah. saying you know that's just, that's comedy, guys. <laughs> so I'm being joke. That, that's a joke. Please, please, no. I you know we actually yeah. get along, so we get along very well. But no, see, I did. I had people who were like, "Are you kidding me? You were part of the these guys came to you and you turned them down. You told them to go. Yeah. F, you not only did you turn them down, you told them to go f themselves." Yeah, yeah, truthfully, like, I'm just kidding. I don't want to kill anybody or hurt anybody, but, <laughs> but <laughs> I would have to think about it. There would be some time. I would have to mull that over, you know. It would have to be someone that you didn't know, right, in, in another city. <laughs> well, no, I think there's plenty of people that I know that I'd give up. It just depends on, on who, <laughs> you know. I can see you walk into the studio tomorrow, people are just like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we heard you last night, man. I, look, <laughs> think about this, man. All you have to do is give up somebody you know, somebody you care about a little, and you get to get on an aircraft and go check out the moons of Jupiter. Yeah. You're really not going to join that club. You're not going to go give up your buddy Larry down the street to go join, to go stand on a spaceship and look at the, the – or or. Or look at another galaxy and hang out with like hoity toities and drink champagne at some other galaxy with like women with six boobs. <laughs> You're not going to do that. I, I'm going to find it pretty hard not to, you know. And, you know, my parents are getting older. They don't really need to live much longer. I mean, mercy, they, <laughs> might, they would understand. I think, you know, maybe if I could just while I was executing my, my mom. If I could say, Mom, they, they asked me to join the club. And then she'd be like, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, and it, yeah, you finally did something with your life, right? That's what my mom would do. Is that you finally did something <laughs> with your life. <laughs> well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and she's like, I've just been hanging out just to make sure that you were okay anyway. So now that you're okay, go ahead. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> now I see where the Pokemon stuff comes from. <laughs> <laughs> Oh uh, Lord! I certainly hope that's the. I, I mean, I, I I don't hope that's the way the world works, but there there certainly is some w- some weird stuff uh, uh going on out there in the in the secret, yeah, the top secret and above world, and the the folks that I meet in that world, I I, I t- tend to cross paths with them occasionally because 
the if you go on the circuit and you go on the the, the convention circuit, the Star Trek scene, you tend to meet a lot of military people. Oh, yeah. a, a lot of Star Trek fans are are military. Uh, a lot of Star Trek fans are tech, uh, and so every once in a while, I'll run into some like you know above talks of the above top secret like way up there type of folks who I try to get as much information out of as I can. Who, but they're always like so what's incredible about that type of person is they are they tend to be you're like really they tend to appear to be like just the really the nicest normalist you know yeah we've been working for the navy for 45 years and yeah. i developed the blankety blank blank uh you know that i can't tell you about but I can tell you it's pretty neat. Well, you know, th this is the thing, though, is that most of that stuff, it, 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 it how do I, well, unless you're doing you weapon design, it's different. Kind of like my stuff is, it's, it's it was mm. benign in nature when it was created. Yeah. And then, then someone, someone with an evil intention said, well, wait a minute, we can do this stuff. And it, it, you know, we can use this for this or that or that or this. And, you know, but weapons are different. You know, most of those guys, but see, most of those guys think they're, well, I'm doing it for God and country. I'm making sure a soldier's yeah. not going to, you know, I'm giving our government the, the heads up. They just don't know that they're, that the government's going to turn around and sell to China. But that's another story for another topic. Yeah. Another day. So, yeah, but yeah no, they're doing it for God and country, but they don't realize that the country is yeah. owned by people outside the country at this point. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, I used to go to, you know, there was a convention. I, I never got into, <laughs> the, the Trekkie scene or the star. I never got into comic con or any of that stuff. Cause the last thing I felt is that we needed another fat man dressed up as, you know, Dr. captain Khan? Kirk or whatever, or, or Spock. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I never, but I did. Last the, thing we need is one more Klingon. Excuse me. Last thing we need is one more Klingon. Yeah. Another, yeah, we need another. And I want to get, I, all right. So now you opened it up. So I'm, I'm going to start, I'm going to start asking the hard ones. So, right. what is the craziest thing, fan wise? And you, and I will tell you, uh, I'm gonna shut up because I'm, I'm just gonna say this. Can you please say hello to Sherry Morrison in our chat room? She is just Absolutely. going crazy. So I'll shut up, and you can say something. Else. Give Sherry a special message, and then we'll move on. Hey, Sherry Morrison. It's Manu and Tereme. Thanks for listening, by the way. And Sherry, if it's the Sherry that I think it is, with the blonde hair that I've seen in Vegas a couple times, a special hello to you. I, I, I love you. Thanks for volunteering for the circuit. Thanks for getting the word out. If that's not you and you're the Sherry Morrison that I haven't met, it's very nice to meet you. And thanks for listening in. And support the circuit. Go to www.thecircuitfilm.com and spread the word because we're launching on the 20th and we're going to make 10 of the funniest episodes, uh, 10 directors, 10 genres, one convention, and everybody's invited to this film. It's going to be crazy. The genres will cross. And thank you for your support for that film and throughout my career. And thanks for listening in. Thanks, there, Sherry. There, there you go. Now you made her day. I, she's, she's all like, no way, but, uh, we're going to get to, you know, we're going to get to the, we're, we're going to get to the circuit here in a minute, but let, let's talk about the craziest thing that you've ever had happen to you at, at one of the, one of the conventions. That's a loaded question, man. Cause the, the, oh, I know I could be honest with you and, in and then it just gets weird because there's levels of crazy. There's there's like sexual crazy. There's just plain surreal crazy. There's um, there's fat guy crazy. There's fat guy crazy. <laughs> there's there's like I can't believe that this is actually happening to me, but it's kind of cool crazy. For instance, just recently, I was invited to a convention called Manticon in Minneapolis. Okay. Now, Manticon, I didn't know what I was getting into, and I don't regret this at all. The people were lovely, but it was quite a surreal experience because I said, sure, they, they paid my fee, they had me come out. I thought, all right, we'll go show some fans the, the, the new work, the new films, um, and, and this will be a fun weekend. The, the day before I leave, I get an email 
And in the email, it says something to the effect of uh, Honorary Space Lord Monuente Reme, you will be, you will head out at 0800 from planet Delta 7 Los Angeles X airport and you will land in Minneapolis at and then they made up something and you will be picked up by honorary space lord um lieutenant something or other something or other and i was like what's going on here and i got there and when i got there uh this gentleman was in all was in full fatigues and holding up a card that said my name and when we got to the place I didn't understand what kind of a convention it was. It, the Manticon folks are fans of the Honor Harrington series. And the Honor Harrington series is a book by Dan David Weber that's got like 20 books long. And it's about the Navy, the Space Navy of the future, the Manticoran Navy. And in this particular convention, every single person almost, 90% of the people there are dressed in full manticore and navy uniforms and they're like larping or cosplaying the whole time they're there so when they bring me in to introduce me they go are you ready to come in the room mr ente reme yes i come in the room and like 500 people stand up (laughs) click their heels full military (laughs) mr ente reme is entering the room (laughs) you know the full-on like military salute and then be seated, and everyone sat, and I'm just getting stared at by all these hard, hardcore Navy space cadets. And it turns out every one of them were totally cool. And then getting into that mindset for a few days, I was like, what the hell? I'm just going to go with this. This is, yeah. this is wild. Yeah. And I even told them, I'm like, you know what? I've been doing these conventions for 15 years, and this might be the most surreal moment I've ever had. Um. But then they stayed in character for three days and they had like, you know, you could challenge people to a battle and you could challenge, you know, Space Lord 17, you have offended my honor. I will meet you on the dueling field at 1700. And you would, you know, go down and watch a duel, but it was with Nerf pistols. Um, But it was pretty fantastic. Now that's the, that's the surreal weird, right? Like you couldn't write that. You, you, you wouldn't know that existed if you weren't on the convention circuit that this family of of you know reenactors uh that don't even have a movie they just have a book series they like they're not even a, they don't even have their film yet right um exist and and the and the fan club is like 5000 people strong all the way across the world all participating in this thing and uh, I love it because I love geek culture and I love human beings uh, playing, growing up in their older age and still playing and and forgetting about the the social norms and regulations of uh, adulthood. And and, um, it's pretty neat to see that kind of stuff. You know, let's face it, the chicks are hot too. Some of them. Well, yeah. and, And that's the other thing. Like, you know, when I was 24, I was sitting at a bar, this girl that was dressed up like a trill just walked right over to me and pretty much offered me whatever I wanted right then and there in the most bold uh, offering you could possibly imagine and how do you say no to that yeah as a young man yeah absolutely young man absolutely how do you say no to that yeah um and so things like that but then also you know sort of beautiful experiences have happened to me at these conventions, like life-changing experiences where somebody that I've looked up to all my life just tells me something that clicks. And, uh, you know, the the few moments I got to speak with Leonard Nimoy were pretty cosmic moments oh, where wow. I, I, I uh, learned some things about life. And uh, I was amazed at just the, the patience and the the ability to listen and the the enlightened spirit that that guy had and then to think about how many generations of star trek i was disconnected from him and yet still connected because he was the guy that started it all with that cast and rod i mean and 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 gene 
and that I owed him basically the life that I had at that point because he'd created such a fantastic show that had lasted through seven other incarnations or whatever. Um, but uh, I'll finish with just this one. I was at a convention once where the security for the entire convention was the equivalent of, I won't say what biker gang, but the dude that ran the con, awesome guy, his security was like the Hell's Angels, let's say, you know? Um, And so you had this full-on family geekathon where the security were all these hardcore bikers. And then at the end of the show, Saturday night, there was this gigantic biker party upstairs that the celebrities were all invited to. And, you know, half of the celebrities were... Uh, too scared to even join the party i took full advantage and just sat there and watched the surreal quality of bikers and strippers and star trek Trek. (laughs) 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 and geeks you know and then yeah i can imagine i can yeah well you know like i said i I as a computer guy so we would always have our uh our computer convention in, in vegas and the and the day after our convention ended the uh the porno convention started yeah are you, you know? talking about the hacker thing the well no that convention? was that was devcon that was the that was yeah. the, the hacker that's all military now if you go to devcon you're pretty much signing your your life away because those guys are are tracking you uh, that's uh-huh. all ran by the military there's other ones now that are kind of underground hacking conventions no this was the um oh gosh i have to pull it up i got a shirt signed by bill gates but it was the it was the big computer convention that went on for so oh. many years uh, there in Vegas. It was there in Vegas and in Chicago. But the one in Vegas, you'd want to go to the one in Vegas because when our convention ended, um, the strip the the porno convention right next to the hall, right next door, would start. And of course, and that's you, where they do the the porn awards every year. Yeah, too, the right? ABN awards exactly. But you would have all these geeks. It, I mean, it was a great thing because, of course, you, I, I, I think Wonderful. it was all put together. Well, yeah, they would have, I mean, think about it. You have all these geeks showing up and what's, you know, you got, you know, geeks that are socially inadequate that can't communicate with anybody. And, and all these girls the that are just rocking right up to them and going, hey, come hey, on yeah, over here. Do, yeah. And, you know, of course, you had all these geeks that had the money and, and mm-hmm. so it was a great marriage. Convention. That sounds fun. I'd like to do an episode on that. That's 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 a great. <laughs> there you go. That's I, a, oh, I got experiences. I don't personally hold on before I get in trouble. I don't personally have experience. I have stories. <laughs> I, I, can, I can share with you. I don't have personal. I don't have personal experiences. I, I, but I do have stories. I I, I have friends. <laughs> But yeah, some, no, was... see, some pretty wild things have happened to me on on the convention circuit, and I've saved the best stories for the film. So yeah, well, um, let's, let, let's talk about that. The the circuit. What are you, I mean? What what are you doing there? What's going on with that? So the circuit project has been the circuit film has been uh, percolating in my brain probably for fifteen years, and we decided to do it this year because this year is the fiftieth anniversary of the convention scene as we know it. And we figured if we don't tell our stories this year and sort of make a, a a record of, of both the truth and the fiction um, that goes on behind the scenes at conventions and, and amalgamate it all together into a, a beautiful anthology film. So it started as a bunch of different ideas, but now after eight months of planning and putting actors together and crew and writers and directors, we've got it down to 10 directors are going to bring you 10 stories uh, in 10 different genres that all take place over the weekend of a pop culture convention. And it's called the circuit. So for instance, uh, say, a couple of actors from one of your favorite sci-fi shows are on the way to the convention. One of them turns out to be not an actor at all, but a CIA black ops hitman. 
and his best friend that's known him for 30 years catches him um, having just killed three people in cold blood, and he has to join that mission uh, in order to survive, stay his best friend, and possibly be a part of the club. Those guys get to the convention and then say, this is just an, uh, an idea of what this film could be. And then say the other actor turns out to be KGB. He shoots his friend. These are two actors you know and love, say like George Takei and Nichelle Nichols or something like that from the original Star Trek. And they're one's KGB, one's, and, and it's, you know, a, a spy thriller. That story ends, and then the camera will just slowly trail off that story and find one of our other characters, say Cody St. New from Teen Wolf. Uh, we have the, one of the stars of Teen Wolf on our show. Now say he's at the convention, and unbeknownst to him, he actually is a werewolf. And his handlers have forgotten that that weekend is the full moon, so he's going to turn that night. That's what we mean. We're going to have story to story to story to story, except one will be a sci-fi story, one will be a horror story, one will be a buddy comedy, one will be a romance, one will be a fantasy epic, one will be a time travel story that connects them all together, one will be a zombie apocalypse story, and all the conventions and all the genres will cross in that convention weekend space. And the coolest thing about the whole project is we have five screenplays written by professional writer-directors from Hollywood that have done many films. We're basically a group of, of a, a, a super team of the guys that brought you For the Love of Spock, Star Trek Renegades, and the new Renegades, Fifth Passenger, and we're teaming up with the visual effects wizards that brought you Iron Man and... Oh my God! I mean, uh, Disney's planes, Red Tails, Hellboy, Sky Captain, and the World of Tomorrow, Spider-Man Two, and we have cast from every genre that you love at conventions. Fan, you know, Game of Thrones, Defiant, Star Trek, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Teen Wolf, icons of the sci-fi community. Yeah. Uh, Cast from The Hobbit, we've got Sylvester McCoy, who played um, Radagast the Brown in the new Hobbit films. So we've got all the right actors to do all these genres. And to top it off, we're asking the fans to be a part of this. And five of the stories, we've asked the fans to submit a 1 to 20 page screenplay or a 1 to 20 page short story at the website the the circuitfilm.com website and five of the scripts will actually it's it's your chance as a a fledgling filmmaker or a fledgling writer sure. to get your script picked and have it become part of the 10 story genre that uh, and you'll get credit for it and you'll come in you'll work you'll get to see your film shot um if it's perfect, we'll just leave it as is. If not, our writers will, you'll work with our writers to spiff it up. Um, and then we're going to make all these stories interconnect and make this really, really fun uh, Galaxy Quest meets the Twilight Zone type of anthology film that is the, the most fan collaborative and professional celebrity made feature film in the history of Hollywood. No, that, 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 that's going to be cool. Yeah, that's the circuit wrapped up in a nutshell. And uh, basically, you know, even if people don't support the campaign, we've done a lot to make the campaign interesting and fun. Uh, the video that you said you just saw, we put a lot of production into teaser videos um, to just have let the fans have fun. We're going to release a new video every week for the next 10 weeks. Uh, and then the main full-length trailer will be released September 19th, one day before the Kickstarter. And what we hope to do is we hope to raise at least enough money on the Kickstarter. It would be great if we raised uh, enough to make the entire film on the Kickstarter and the fans really got behind this thing. But we'd love to raise at least half the budget 
because just like films in the past that I've worked on, at that point we can go match funds with other production entities. Sure. We can bring it to a studio. We can bring it to Amazon or Netflix, and uh, we can match funds and get the film uh, completely finished that way as well. So, um, we're just hoping everybody likes the idea, and if they do, please you know join in. Follow us at the Circuit Movie on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube or Instagram or any social media at the Circuit Movie, or find out how to be a part of the movie and a part of the production at thecircuitfilm.com. Yep, and we're we're gonna have all those links out there on our site so people can link up, and of course we'll be promoting the heck out of it, and and everything. And w- one of the questions in in the chat room, someone's asking is, what was it like working with Jerry Ryan as Seven of Nine? Oh, I mean, those were probably two of the hardest years of my life. I, I just, you know, it was so difficult. She was just so. So just, you know, she's so hideously unattractive. It's really hard to look at her. And it's like, it was really hard for me to go on set and, and you know, have to look at someone so so terrifyingly, you know, ugly. And, and then have to do a, a scene with her. Um, and uh, plus her personality was just, you know, um, perfect. So she's perfect and she's hilarious and she's funny and she's charming and she's got great eyes, but it's just that she's so, so hideous, you know? And and it was two years of, you know, having to work with someone so just disproportionately monstrosity, you know, she was like just terribly ugly. Um, and that, that was probably the most difficult part. Um, you know that I'm kidding. Well, Jerry I'm, Ryan is the I'm most here, beautiful. I, 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 while I was waiting for the break, I'm like, look, once yeah. again, guys, we're not going to do your homework for you. You might want to Google <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jerry Ryan. <laughs> Jerry Ryan uh, is absolutely gorgeous, and yeah. she's an absolute class act. She's funny. Uh, she's got beautiful boobs, a, a, a beautiful body, a, a top-notch actor, and she was she was a blast. I mean, I was 21 years old and 22 when I got that role, yeah. and there is this just bombshell blonde um, that is a more than competent, could act me out of a paper bag uh, in front of me, and mostly it was just a challenge to keep up with her and to try not to giggle too much when she was in my presence uh because she was you know she was such a blast it was like being at summer camp um except that i couldn't kiss the cast cast you know camp counselor (laughs) because she was dating at the time i couldn't even flirt with her you know not that i had a chance anyway i was you know 21 um but she was dating brandon braga the the showrunner so flirting was not allowed I, I got i got away with as much as i could um and to this day i, I love jerry ryan and um hopefully i will get to work with her again soon I, I i'd love it if the circuit was a slam dunk and we could start uh offering jerry and kate and patrick stewart and uh kate mulgrew and and george decay and people like that uh could start coming aboard coming with you now most of the actors are are they donating their time or are they are, are they expecting to get Oh no! Uh, I mean, every actor that that signed on and uh, that shot uh, everything for us so far ha- has been—they've um, been really, really kind with with how much they've done for free uh, in order to launch this project. Everybody really believes in it, um, and I've been blown away by the amount of help that I've got. But these are my friends, you know, um, most of them. Uh, a few of the cast were, were people that I met at on the circuit and, and pitched the project to, and they decided to help out. Sure. But it, it's definitely been a labor of love. I think everybody knows how good of an idea it is. And so everybody's done everything they're willing to do for free, including everybody. Uh, you know, I've been in this business for uh, close to 20 years now and i've probably pulled every favor from every visual effects artist and director and and cameraman and uh, that i can possibly get and and plus we've invested a a decent amount of money in in this campaign too uh, because we we knew that we would have to invest something and we would have to show some people our capabilities um doing things on the cheap uh to you know we'd have to put in 
a little bit of money at least to show people that what we're capable of. Um, so over the next 10 weeks, I really hope people go to the circuitfilm.com and, and watch the weekly teasers and uh, read up on how you can join it. And when we launch the Kickstarter September 20th, there's a bunch of great perks, including you know joining the production. And the, the, the cool thing that we're doing is everybody that supports and no matter whether you support from like the five dollar range all the way up to like the twenty thousand dollar range or, or whatever you can send us your resume to info at the circuit and tell us why you're into filmmaking and what department you want to work in whether it's art department camera makeup acting sound directing all the key departments and for as long as we fund this and the act the, the fan base gets behind it and we get enough money to make it Every single episode of the film, we're going to bring on a bunch of fan, a bunch of the people from the fan base, you know, eight to ten people for all the key departments of the film to come in and and work on the film and and get there to intern basically and and uh, show us their talents and get their foot in the door of the industry and to collaborate with us on what is essentially a celebration of film genre at the same time as all the stories take place at the place we go to celebrate genres. Um, so I think without the, without the fans, you know, writing half of the episodes and coming to work on the project, then it wouldn't really be the circuit because half, if not more than half of the convention circuit is about what the fans, what they're doing, what their stories are. And uh, I love it that we get to do, a genre twist and there's going to be a lot of truth spilled in the circuit. So it'll be fun to, to try to decipher between truth and fiction. Cool. I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, I, I, yeah. I'm not a rich man, so I can't donate anything, but I can donate. I, I can get the word out. <laughs> well, I appreciate can, it. We I can appreciate talk it, about it. Letting but, us come on and talk about it. Yeah, it's, no, um, absolutely. I, I did have one question for you because someone, someone asked me when they found out you're coming out, renegade what's up with that what's going on what do we need oh, to do to we, get another we, we season two and three going yeah we just shot episode two and they just did an indiegogo to finish for uh post-production funds and they raised five hundred thousand dollars to shoot episode two and we just finished shooting it and it, uh, the script this time around i thought was much stronger stronger uh, new actors, uh, Robert Beltran and uh, Terry Farrell, who are also in the circuit, uh, joined the party. Um, so did Nichelle Nichols. Um, and uh, I'm going to miss a couple of people. I apologize to those folks, but there's a couple of other new talent on board. But all the, the surviving cast members really up their game. And, you know, when you have the first time you shoot a, a pilot episode, you're finding your character and you're you're sort of you know so half you're half in it half out of it and when we shot this time i felt like everybody really knew who they were playing and so there's much stronger performances this type around time around uh, a, a much better screenplay more money to make it with and I, i'm really happy that the fans uh liked the first one and supported the second one because the second one is definitely going to be better than the first wow, that's um I, I was blown away by it and uh, I hope those same fans come over and support the circuit too, and and let me show them what what I can do. Uh, they'll get a chance to see, you know, my producing uh, talents in Fifth Passenger, which will be out uh, early next year as well. Which was also a, a fan funded project that we matched funds for with another production entity and shot last year. It's a space thriller, and it's great. It stars me, Tim Russ, Marina Sirtis, Armin Shimmerman, Morgan Loria, and. Um, Doug Jones. You've got you. I think you you have a couple, couple movies that are coming in post production. Do you not? Oh yeah, Fifth Passenger is going into post. Uh, Promises is still in post. Uh, Benjamin Troubles is a film that I produced way back. This is it was five years ago. We finally sold it. It was finished and sold to a film to a company called Indie Rights, so it should be out soon. Uh, the Green Fairy, which is a, the history of absinthe. absinthe. Uh, I got to play Oscar Wilde's uh, lover, Robert Ross, and the man who played Oscar Wilde was Rowdy Rowdy Piper, and I, I, I was oh, wow. so excited to get to work with him before he passed. Um, 
uh, Unbelievable is coming out, which is a film with uh, Stephen, F- that directed by Stephen uh, Stephen Fawcett and produced by Angelique Fawcett, and it's like forty of us Trek actors uh, mocking ourselves, um, doing like a naked gun version of uh, Invasion from the Body Snatchers. That'll be out next month. Uh, Instant from Roddenberry's coming out, and there's a few more too. I mean, we, I've been working really hard, so. Yeah. Um, a lot of good stuff coming. No, that, that, that I was I was looking, you know, at, at the uh, the IMDb, and I was like, well, you got a lot of movies that are, you know, a lot of production that's coming out on top of the, you know, the fact that you're you're doing this the whole circuit thing. I mean, that's yeah. I mean, that's huge. Well, now, you're, are you the you're the you're the producer for the circuit, right? Are you yeah, the main I'm the executive producer of the circuit? And I basically bet everything that I've done over the last two years on the circuit being amazing. I, I thought, you know, with 15 years on the convention circuit, I had to make a movie out of it, yeah. and I had to make it fun, and I want to make it big budget. So, you know, I've risked I've risked a lot and put in a lot, and and so have all my friends and family and all these actors that have joined, and and. You know, we're just going to cross our fingers and, and really hope that this thing takes off and the fans get as excited about it as we are. Yeah. No, that's exciting. Now, a little bit, I mean, let's talk, I know, you know, this is a porn, uh, uh, paranormal, not porno. This is a, par- a, por- this is a porno. I, we've been this doing a porno something show. wrong then. We, we, yeah, you know. this is a porno show. No, this is a paranormal show, and I know that we're kind of getting away, but this, I find this fascinating, you know, because a lot of people, when we go, when we watch TV and when we go movies, we don't really think of the effort you know we appreciate it but we really don't think of the effort of everything that goes in to making like a tv series like renegade like let's just talk about renegade which was made basically for um uh was it hulu or or amazon prime that was amazon prime no, I mean, I think we're just, uh, they may release, they may get a release because they're no longer a Star Trek show. So they, they oh. may get a release on Amazon. I think that's what they're hoping for. Okay. Uh, but it, it was released just on YouTube. Just I, the fans, it was just a YouTube. the fans for it. Oh. We made it and then we showed it to them on YouTube. How many people did it take besides the actors and act, the actors, I to say actors, how many uh-huh. people, uh, how many people do you, did it take to, to make that? Well, I think it's a you know you you at least have a crew of twenty five to to thirty five on set just to run the cameras and lights and 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 make sure everybody's safe and um, then you've got all the digital effects artists so you're probably looking at at least a couple hundred people um, two fifty including actors of of people that have actually put some sort of work into the project wow. uh, and that's on a low budget film you know so. Um, it's really hard to crank out a good movie um, unless you have, you know, the 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 devil on your side. And um, uh, you know, Sky Conway from Renegades, he he might have a little help from, uh, you know, uh, some some demon spirits. I'm not sure. He looks like a, you know, he when he laughs, he looks like he's got a little demon right ro- rolling around with him. Uh, I, I'm kidding. I love the guy. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, just. Uh, when you see a really great movie, you really don't understand in, unless you really start thinking about it. You know, when you see like Captain America run up the street and then jump over a couple of cars and there's 60 soldiers behind him getting shot and killed and a digital crane swooping over them and probably like 60 uh, CGI people working their butt off and a sound designer making every film making is incredibly hard. And the idea behind all these people working hard is to make the film look like flawless and perfect. Mm-hmm. And so the idea is to make the make the viewer not think about, just think about how cool that looks, not think yeah. about all the effort it took. All the effort. You know. Um, See, that's why I don't like movies, to be honest with you, because I, I'm looking at it thinking about, I'm one of the guys that look for flaws. Number one, I'm an I'm I'm, yeah. I'm that a hole. Uh, I don't. But the good news is, is I don't post it. But I, watching movies in my house, it drives my family nuts because I will stop the movie and I'll roll it back and say, "Well, they were facing this way, this way, and now they're facing you know, this way, or, you know that kind of nuance." Or, or wait a minute, their tie was a different color, <laughs> or they're you know they had. Here they had shoes. Here they didn't. Here they had a glove in their right hand. They, 
So, yeah, watching movies in my house, it's just like, will you just watch a freaking movie, Jeff? With and, movie? dude, that's that's one of the most impossible things about filmmaking. Continuity is yeah. so hard. you got to have people taking pictures of every scene, and, and the uh, scripty who's looking at the script and all the previous shots has to remember where this plate was, this fork was, how the shirt was looking, how the tie was looking, where his hair was. Really difficult stuff, especially when you get into blood effects and stuff. But like you said, this is a paranormal show. I, we we talked about my movie, and we talked about movies. Let's talk about some uh, paranormal stuff. Yeah, let's man. get into some. Yeah, let's get here. We go. All the kids are tucked in bed and, and everything. You know, let mm -hmm. let it, like I said, I'm gonna let you talk as much as you want to uh, to talk about this because I understand. You know, my my concern is is that this is career affecting. We well, I'm really hear... excited about it. To, to, it at least the circuit also is, uh, in a sense, it's it's a paranormal film. We're going to do a supernatural episode. We're going to do a horror episode. Uh, we were hoping to do a story about a haunted hotel, considering a lot of these conventions take place in hotels, and we were sure. going to uh, contact a bunch of the people at the hotels that the conventions are held at to see if we could find a good story to, to, to try to milk. Um, but there definitely will be some paranormal stuff in this film. In the one. Well, the, well, the one is what you got it. Well, I submit my script, right? I gotta write it right now, but there's mm -hmm. that hotel in, what is it? Tennessee or there, it's on YouTube and uh, where the, where they hear screaming, they hear crying coming from the room and the security guard goes there. And they're, and they're like, don't open up the door until the police show up. And the guy, the guy opens up the door. And as he opens up the door, the white shadow, it's all caught on security cam, come, <laughs> comes running out of the room. You can't um, see, you know, the, the, the what orb or whatever. What up on? Is it on YouTube? Yeah, that's on YouTube. It's, uh, it, it, it's one of the hottest. It's, yeah, it's, it's incredible. It's, uh, the, but there, there's a complaint that they're, they, the people that were on both sides of the room heard someone crying and then crying out in the room and so the security guard goes there and there's no one in the room the security guy is sitting there and he's on his walkie talkie he's like look i hear i hear and you can hear it in the ccc camera he's saying look i hear someone crying in this room and the manager's like don't go in you know wait until the police get here and the guy was like i'm going in and he goes in and of course turns on the light there's no one there but as minute as he opens up the door, you see like a white shadowy figure come out of the room. It's, Is this something at that hotel that's like happens on a, a, a regular basis? All the time. It happens all the time. It, they say that actually they, they don't rent that room out anymore. You know, one of the creepiest things I saw, and I forgot what hotel it happened at, but it was a couple of years ago, downtown L.A., at one of the hotels, and it's that security camera footage of that girl that disappeared, and then they found her found a month her in later the tower. in the uh, in the water tank for yes. the building. Yes. And that footage is some of the creepiest footage. It just gave me chills because you can you can tell that she's stuck in some either drug induced haze yeah. or some sort of spiritual. Uh, something's messing with her because she's talking to herself. She's a little yes. out of her mind. And then she's looking outside the elevator and then hiding inside the elevator and the elevator doors don't want to close for her. And it's one of the most eerie 55 seconds or whatever it is that, that you'll ever see. And then, then that's the last time people ever saw her yeah. until three weeks later when uh, people figured out they were drinking her uh, creepy stuff. That, I, that, that is, yes, that, that, and is. that, that hotel as well is like a really old hotel. So the idea that something uh, paranormal could have happened there, uh, I don't, uh, I, it wouldn't surprise me. That's all I would say. Yeah. Well, you, I, I just Googled YouTube hotel ghost and it's the first one that pops up. Uh, that's the video. It, it is one of the most bizarre things. I mean, you know, you're in the bit, you know, I, I don't, I see a lot of videos. People submit videos to me and say, Hey, what do you think about this? I get a lot of EBV, EVPs because my background is, is the sound side okay. of it. So I, I can, I can rip a sound audio file apart and put it back together. And, and I, I know all the tricks of the trade. 
So I get a lot of EVPs. That, but I will tell you, when it comes to video, I discount them because I know that anybody with a with a with the talent can with Adobe Effects and everything can pretty much yeah. make anything. And you know that as well. But this yeah. one here is just it's it is it, it's creepy because it 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 looks i mean it definitely is coming from a ccc camera and so and there's no there's no manipulation that i can tell i don't see any overdubbing i don't see the tall tail you know the overdubbing marks and stuff like that so it, yeah. it this is yeah if you haven't seen it there you go there's your there's your story you had to have one where uh where, where one of your your uh stars or whoever is assigned a room that's haunted yeah i i'll check it out i also i've had a paranormal experience i don't know if uh you ever listen to fade to black oh yeah 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 absolutely i did it i i told a uh the story on fade to black but i'll tell it again if you haven't heard it. no let, let's hear it. so the little blue guys wasn't there wasn't the story i thought that was your story no that's the ufo story that's... i've seen a ghost too oh let's hear it i'm I'll, let's go Besides my grandma, who says hey every now and then. Yeah, let's go. Let's hear it. <laughs> um, so I was very young. I, I think I was uh, probably six at the time. But m- my whole life I've told this story to people. And it's it used to give me goosebumps every time I told it because it would always bring that eerie feeling back. But I've told it so many times now that I, I, it doesn't creep me out. But I am still affected by it to the point where... I'll get to it. I'll tell you how it's affected me uh, to this day. I was six years old. I was somewhere in the South. And when I grew up, I grew up with hippie parents who were always on the road to different communes, different campgrounds, crashing out at different people's houses. We were in a VW bus, a camper, et cetera. And we were somewhere in the South, and I don't know where. Um, but we were staying at a couple's house. And I was sitting there probably six, seven years old, and I was watching – uh, the Muppet, uh, the Muppet Show, uh-huh. or Sesame Street, um, and this—I don't know—maybe fourteen, fifteen-year-old kid sits down next to me and he taps me on the shoulder and he says, "Hey, man, you want to come upstairs and play Buck and Bronco?" And I immediately was just excited that this older kid wanted to play, and so I followed him down this hallway. I remember taking a left up this staircase that went up and then it hit a wall and then it made a corner and then it went up again. And when we got to the top of the staircase on the left, we walked into a room and in that room was a a green hardwood floor. I remember it was painted green. And in the far corner of the room, there was a dirty mattress that was just laying there. Nothing else was in the room except in the far corner of the room, straight in front of me was the dirty mattress to my to my right was a wall with a, a long trench coat hanging on it. And to the left of that was uh, some closed blinds uh, that there must have been a window there. The kid said, hey, you go first. And he got up on his hands and knees on the mattress. So I got up on top of him and tried to ride him and he bucked me off really hard like like threw me off hard and i remember hitting that that wooden floor and looking up at him like you know wow you know you didn't have to do it that hard you know i was like yeah. i didn't know we were we were gonna hurt each other and he just smiled at me and it, i remember the smile being just sort of sadistic and th- then I turned my head to the right over where that trench coat was hanging. And I swear to God, now this is an old memory. I'm 38 years old now. But I remember that trench coat started to float off of the wall very slowly towards where I was sitting. And as it approached me, I looked over at the kid like, oh my God, what, what's happening we should get out of here kind of look. And he just kept smiling at me. So I stood up and I backed up all the way to the door and that trench coat got within two, three feet of me. And I remember hearing it. I don't remember if it was an audible voice that I heard or whether it was just like a telepathic 
uh, message, but a really low voice, whether I heard it or whether it was just in my head, went, get out of here. And I ran down those steps, ran down the hallway, and my mother was at the end of the hallway, and I remember her being there. And I just ran up to her, and I hugged her as tight as I could, and I was crying. And I think from that point on, I blocked the memory out. Like it was so creepy that I just blocked it out. And when I was about 17, <clears throat> I was in high school, and I was laying down to go to sleep one night, and suddenly that memory popped back into my head. And I went, what the heck kind of a memory is that? Like, did that happen? Like, that happened. That, yeah. What is that? So I went and I talked to my mother. And I said, Mom, do you ever remember this house in the south? And we were staying at it. And, you know, I, and I told her the story. And she said that she didn't remember me ever, you know, running up to her and holding her and crying. Uh, but that she remembered the house and she remembered the couple. And the reason that we were staying there is the couple was uh, letting us stay there for the last two weeks of their, they had given notice to move because two years before three teenagers had committed a mass suicide in the upstairs bedroom. And, the couple that was staying there had seen the ghost of a young man. Both of them had seen him walking around downstairs out of the corner of their eyes and it freaked them out. So they were moving out. So they were like, Hey, you're welcome to stay here, but we're leaving. And we saw, we've seen this creepy stuff, but crash here until we're going to go. And then you guys can go too. And that's what my mother told me. So, I tend to believe, oh, and by the way, this couple did not have a child. It was just, they were a single couple. So I think unless some weird teenagers, living teenagers, played some incredible prank on some poor seven-year-old kid, that the ghost of a dead suicide victim had me come upstairs to the room where they had killed themselves yep. and played Buck and Bronco with me and scared the ever loving crap out of me. Yeah. Wow. To this day, I cannot in any, in, in any place that I live, like in my house, I cannot hang a jacket, a piece of clothing, a towel, anything like that on a hook in my room when I'm sleeping at night because I have this stupid, uncanny fear that I'm going to see it float off that hook and come my direction. Wow. So uh, obviously whatever happened that day was traumatic enough that, you know, I still can't handle looking at things hanging on walls that are items of clothing. Yeah. It just makes me. <laughs> it yeah. just makes me. Uh, I, I get it. I, I yeah. I wouldn't. I I can. Yeah. I wouldn't. Like. Yeah. I I had a uh, demonologist on the show, and I have the same phone. I have my my grandmother passed last year. Actually, it was a year and a week ago, and my mother gave me her crucifix off of her her casket. And the proper thing is, I'm supposed to hang it up in my house. You know, I'm supposed to hang it up. And I mm -hmm. tell, I tell, I had a, uh, Debbie, uh, Vigay, she actually wrote the Wicked series and, uh, did some, she wrote for, uh, the craft, well, the, not the craft, what was the charmed? She was a writer for charmed as well, but she was on the show and I was talking to her and I said, I don't believe that this, this crucifix is, is evil. I, I don't believe that at all, but I can't hang it up. And she's like, well, why? And I said, because I'm, I'm my, my concern is because of what I do that I'll come into the room and that sucker will be hanging upside down or something. That's kind of like a message like, yeah, like, oh yeah, you, you stepped over the line now. And, uh, even the, the move, the exorcist, I, I can't watch. I mean, the movie I've watched many a times, this new series that's coming out on the exorcist. 
I can't even watch the the trailers for it. I have to turn the channel for some it's strange quite, reason. Quite a creepy movie. Oh, it's it's crazy, but it's just you know it's, it's amazing that how these events, you know how they how they burn themselves into your mind and and you develop these I don't want to say phobias, but like you said, you can't hang these a towel or anything up because of of that. Uh, it, it's just wow. Like you ever seen the the film Nightmare recently? That that documentary about sleep apnea. Um, I have not because I actually have sleep apnea, and I was told not to watch it. Have you ever had the dark figure kind of laughing yep. over you, and, yep. and and you can't move? Yep. Ooh, me too. And I don't have it on a regular basis, but a couple times a year that'll happen to yep. me. I had, uh, you know, well, I, I've, I've told this story before when I was younger. I, you know, took, took, took some, some, some LSD. I guess call it what it is. Took some drugs. Some LDS. Some LDS. So I was, this is when I was, you know, we got back from a party and, Mm -hmm. uh, and I took some LD and it was funny because, um, it wasn't funny. My buddies were like, it's the first time I ever did it. I was always a pot smoker, you know? And and so they, they were like, Oh, try this. So I, so I did it. And, the, and my friend was like, whatever you do, don't look in the mirror. Let me tell no, you the me. secret. Don't, don't ever look in the mirror while you're doing this. I said, okay. So I started tripping and, and everything. And so I went upstairs and, and, and I was up in my bedroom and I was alone and I was sitting there on a bed and this little imp like, um, character. And it actually comes, there's a draw, there's a drawing and I didn't know what the drawing was, but it's called nightmare. But there was a little like imp character and he was like, he's like, I got you. You are mine. You built your soul. You belong to me forever. And that freaked me out. And I will tell you, that is the best rehab that I've ever, because I never touched this stuff ever again after that. I was no, you know, never again, because that freaked me out to the point. But I have had experiences, especially, you know, because I do have sleep apnea. I had one the other night. Um, where I was, I was sitting there in bed. This is weird. I was sitting mm-hmm. there in bed and it was like, it was when that earthquake happened in Italy, like a, a column, a concrete column just crushed me. Boom. And I couldn't mm. move. I, I couldn't move. I couldn't anything. And when I woke up, I woke up into this realm, into this world. Mm-hmm. It was one of the most bizarre things, but yeah, I've, I've had the, the experience where the figure sitting over you, holding, holding you down so you can't breathe. Uh, yeah, I've, I've definitely, and I was told not to watch it. Someone said, look, you might not want to watch this because one of the things like with me, when I was diagnosed with sleep apnea, I went to the sleep center and I woke up in the emergency room. How freaky is that? Why? Because, well, because my, I, my heart rate dropped below its normal part they and they couldn't wake me up and i have those episodes now where i'll be sitting there sleeping and sandy they'll try to wake me up and they're like we can't wake them up and i and i and they can't wake me up and then i'll just wake up eventually yeah wow. can't explain yeah, yeah i mean just... nightmare nightmare to me was uh, you know i mean if you're into the paranormal and you do this show that movie was mind-blowing yeah like when I first started watching it, I was like, yeah, what is this crap? You know, I've uh, experienced this before. Yeah. But by the time it finished and they really, really started talking about the different theories and and how many people around the earth that this happens to on not only a semi-regular basis, but on a regular basis, like nightly. Mm-hmm. Um and that it's been happening for a long time and then, and that every culture has its own version of whatever these things are, uh, if indeed they are things and it's not just a, you know, just a, a reaction to, you know, I have a small theory that when we were hanging out in trees that we had to have some sort and we were scared of the dark and we were fearful and when we were early humans uh that of course always we had to stay still and it, it's a it's a way for you to keep locked in your stillness especially if you're f- fearful and yeah. somehow the subconscious has created a character out of it and uh, i don't know 
but uh, you know it sort of is like the black thing whatever it is or the shapeless thing that you can't quite get a look at it it, it, it to, to me it is just kind of fear itself like in a yeah. nutshell you know yeah no yeah you're you're yeah i mean the experience i've I, I, yeah, I'm so scared to death. I can't move. Yeah, it's terrifying. And, and you, you want to scream out. I'm, all, you know, I'm yeah, always you wanna... trying to scream yeah. out or look at it to yeah. see see what it is to get a better idea of what this thing is. And then usually I wake up going, yep. you know. Yep. Um, but, I, I mean, I... I don't recommend you watch the film if it's going to, but it, it was a beautifully done documentary and, and it was, it was very interesting to, because it was done by a guy who'd experienced it. And then he went around the world talking to, you know, a lot of other people that have heavy duty episodes with it. And they told their stories. Yeah. The scariest part about it truthfully is the rep, the dream uh, rec- recreations that he recreates because they're very much like something I've experienced before, and so seeing it when you're awake is, is done so well is uh, is is pretty creepy. Yeah, because it, it it flips that that trigger, you know, in your subconscious where you you hold it back, and then it's kind of like a boom, the light comes on, and you're like, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. yeah and like, if you I mean if you have it like weekly or something maybe I wouldn't recommend this movie but <laughs> you know the the other thing was it was like the movie said you know if you've had this before or if you one of their theories is if you tell somebody about it that it's never happened to and they take the time to listen that it starts happening to them I don't know if that's true or not but that was one of the things and they also said that if you talk about it and blah, 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 that it's going to happen more often. So I started, when I finished the film, I was like, oh, man, I hope I don't deal with this again soon or this doesn't come back. Because there was a period of my life that it was happening on a semi-regular, you know, a few times a month basis when I was living in, in uh, San Francisco. But it hasn't been much of a problem for years. And after watching the movie, it didn't become a problem again. But I, I was definitely paranoid that it would, because yeah. uh, it, it, it's certainly no kind of fun when it happens. Yeah, I, yeah. Oh, I, I can tell you, I have it at least once, once a week, where I'll have an episode where you know there's a black figure holding me down. And what, what is crazy, is like I said, you know, with with the shows that I do here and everything. I mean, I've got, I've got access to some, you know, experts that are involved and they're like yeah it's it's the you know they're they're trying to get you because of what you do and the message and stuff and it's like they don't worry about it just tell them to go f themselves <laughs> well yeah and i think the other thing you were talking about is is pretty interesting as far as like you know yeah they're interdimensionals messing around with you what, yeah. what else can they do you know yeah yeah you can't give them the power to do it and you know that was always my concern is that uh you know with with doing the you know doing these shows and and talking with people and you know sitting in i sit during the day i get evps and and everything sent to me where i'm doing the analysis of them so i hear these voices all the time and someone said like a like a soldier who's in combat all the time you you continue to do this that stuff is gonna so there's times where i have to ask myself where i'll hear something like you know you heard you know your 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 grandmother or whatever we're all here things and it's like are they audible things being replayed i mean there's times where i've been on that verge of sleep and mm-hmm. and and i think that sandy or someone will, will walk by me i you know i feel that presence of someone walking by me and i'm like what are you doing you know what do you want and then sandy like are you talking she's in the other room she's like, are you talking to me and it's like oh crap <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so it's like all right go and, and like i said that's the reason why i don't hang the cross in in the room because it's not that i believe the cross i just think that's a signal it's kind of like you know if you really wanted to say hey jeff we're here <laughs> we're gonna be messing with you tonight get ready for it you know the, the cross will be turned upside down or something like that but uh yeah it happens it's you know the the world is a strange place and uh but like I said, the, the best defense for me is uh, I took the advice of the people that know, and they said just say, 
you know, go basically go F yourself. And you can't say it alone or inside. You have to actually say it outside. You know, basically go go F yourself <laughs> or get the hell out of here. I'm not I'm not playing with you anymore. And um, yeah, and that works. But, you know, another part of that, like you said, when you tell someone and, and then now it happens more, I, I consider that like the new car syndrome. Have you ever, when you had your car, you go to a car lot and you find a car and you go, this is the car for me. And you buy the car and then as you drive it off the lot, you realize there's like, tw- you, you pass like 20 of the same car as yours. Have you, you ever experienced that? Yeah, <laughs> where where you're like Jesus Christ, everybody's got this car. I and, just and bought this car. Everybody's got yeah. it. Yeah, and it's <laughs> not that everybody's got the car. It's just that you were never cognitive of that car before, and now since you own it, you're now cognitive. And I think that's what goes on with like what you said is that everybody has these experiences. The problem is, or not the problem. The thing is, is that you're not cognitive of it. You, you're not associating it with an actual event or whatever. But now that I put it in your head, kind of like the book Communion by Whitney Strieber, when you saw that face, you go, "Oh crap!" You know, that's what I saw. Yeah. Or when you know, like for me, I was I was going through a museum. I had that experience with the LSD, and I was going through the museum, and I saw the painting of a nightmare, and I was like that's the dude that was sitting on the, on my bed and uh, mm-hmm. you, and I'm looking at him going, you motherfucker. you know, I, but, but that's just the way, the, the way it works. It, I, I think once you, you become cognitive of it, then you, you actually realize it. And I think that's where people like develop the ability is the more and more. And that was always my fear that because doing these shows, I become more and more aware of what, is going on because I'm listening to the experts. They're telling me how to be aware. And yeah, yeah I'm, I'm seeing more and more every day. And it how long have insane. you been doing this? I mean, I well, I've been our bell, but we've been doing the show for, for a month now. And okay. uh, yeah, when we've had some heavy hitters and we're growing, I, while well, you, we talking to get syndicated. Um, awesome. Yeah. Have you, uh, uh, have you, were you, uh, heavily interested in the field before you started oh, doing the show i was fascinated by it. i mean i you know i've always been a, a night person now i had mm-hmm. an experience in my and my mother where i i was near when i was a young kid i was near near death like as close to death as you possibly could be and mm-hmm. uh, i was thank god my my parents were in the military and they 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 flew me in a private jet down to uh um, San Francisco and thank God there was a doctor there. I have a disease. I had some kind of disease infection that they had no idea what it was. And they were like, look, they told my, my mom and dad told me this or my mom told me the other day, my dad doesn't talk about it, said that, uh, they came in there many, they were like, look, he's, he's going to die. Be ready for it. And luckily there was a doctor who was a Vietnam. This guy was in, he was a Vietnam doctor and he saw this disease in in vietnam we saw this infection in vietnam and he you know basically cured me brought me back but i've always had crazy stuff i've always been fascinated by the you know ufos it's just it's kind of in my dna i I, yeah yeah i'm not a I, i love the hard science but see for me my fascination is kind of like randy you know i i like to debunk that's my thing i like to call out the frauds and say look <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah. It, it, it's like difficult enough already without people messing yeah. around. Yeah. Um. So. What? What? Uh, what was I just gonna say? Dang it. Um. It was about. Uh, I forgot it. Oh, Brain fart. It's all right. I got. Um, I, I got more questions for you. All right. <laughs> we'll turn it back on you. So I mean, so you. I mean, obviously you're in the, in, in the, in the crazy culture there in, in LA and, and everything. I mean, how, and I wanted to get to this before it, you know, how much do you feel is, and and you've alluded to it, but how prevalent is the occult in, in LA? I mean, is do you find it, it, it's, it's kind of like an underlying tone because I've heard stories, I've talked to musicians. We've had musicians on the show, and I know musicians. 
uh, and I've talked to them, and and they, I've had musicians flat out tell me they say, yeah, there's, they there's rituals where they'll take the master, uh, which is the master tape, and they'll go into a room and they'll 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 have their ritual, and and yes, yeah. you know they they Heard believe in that. those stories too. Yeah, I mean, have you? experience that or come across any the of that thing is i've heard a lot of stories too but i've never been privy to any sort of ceremonies um uh, but the you know the cr- crappy thing is that i you know unless i was in and then out of that field i wouldn't tell you if i did that's true, <laughs> that's yeah. true. yeah you're not gonna come on my show and say oh yeah by the way i yeah yeah yeah. But no, I, I honestly I I haven't. I I do know just from a lot of, of friends uh in the industry that you know there there's definitely a lot of uh occult and um gnarly sadomasochism clubs and uh, uh satanism uh, clubs and you know pet, child pedophilia rings uh, with the super rich um, and uh, s- stories that aren't just stories, but that have actually affected and messed up friends of mine. One of which is, a, was well, not a real close friend, but, uh, an acquaintance that is, uh, since passed because of how much it messed with his mind as a young child star that had to deal with that, uh, stuff. Um, whether it's more prevalent or less prevalent now than it was in the 80s and the 70s, I, I, I would hope that it was less prevalent, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, and with a few of the more rich, more successful people that I've talked to, I've definitely heard of these folks and these the, the, the people that run in these circles, um, but never been interested in getting to know them. Uh, so... Never seen anything um, personally that uh, made my skin go cold, but I've definitely heard plenty of stories um, about, uh, especially the the you know the the pedophilia, the child yeah. pedophilia yeah. stuff with the the super rich, um, mostly uh, super rich. Well, you know that's not true. Super rich, gay and straight. Um, uh, you know, occult uh, sickness that goes on with taking advantage of young uh, Hollywood talent and yep. young uh, people that may may not even be rich or famous, or but they make these promises and then uh, take advantage of these kids. Yeah. Um, no doubt it happens. No doubt they get away with it. No doubt you you know when you're in the the, the billionaires club and the multi millionaires club, uh, you can get away with a lot more of that type of uh, decadent evil than you can uh, as uh, someone that doesn't have that level of uh, protection. Yeah. Well, uh, I th- I think it definitely happens. I think there's definitely uh, you know, just like the Bohemian Grove, you know, the Bohemian Grove is, this is a fact. That place exists. Yes. Every year, some of the richest people in America, uh, ex-presidents, bankers, Wall Street folks, uh, Koch brothers type of folks, you know, rich, rich, rich people go there and they, they take part in a and then this is a fact this is not like a rumor this is you know been caught on tape they participate in the death of care and that's the ceremony that they that they call the damn thing the death of care meaning in 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 the way i would uh define that is that they go there to celebrate the death of empathy, the death of caring, because if you don't take the time to care about anybody, you can make a whole lot more money than if you do. So I think they sit around and they pat each other on the back and they, they've got this gigantic creepy owl statue. They do a, they, they do a, a play that is very reminiscent of like, 
you know, typical occult stuff like Stanley Kubrick's blah, 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 blah party with all the people in the masks and the robes, eyes wide shut. And they take a woman, a naked woman, and they force her across the stage screaming upstairs and then throw her into a big fire pit. Now, the people at the Bohemian Grove will say, hey, you know, it's a play. It's all a part of a you know it's, it's uh, all fun and uh, games right until an eye fun, gets, or a fun and gets games yeah. entertainment night yeah. of festivities blah 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 but yeah. even if the woman doesn't die and and it is what they say it is it's still pretty freaking disgusting yeah. uh that you would have something called the death of care that did a, did a human sacrifice play I mean, that's just to me that's just not cool that's pretty sick yeah and, um, you know, some of the most rich and powerful uh, movers and shakers of our society as we know it hang out there. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's, that's a fact. And, and then the little pockets of occultism, uh, whether they exist or don't, I, I, I tend to believe they do, but I've never been privy to a, an invite to one, um, probably because when people meet me, they know better than to ask me to something like that because uh, I would um, not go. Yeah. And in fact, you know, probably try to do something about it. Yeah, we we had, I mean, uh, the last show, we had uh, Dr. Richard Allen Miller who comes from the, you know, the Steric Goats thing. I mean, not he wasn't part of that project. But he was part mm-hmm. of a different project, but he... He actually talks about he was part of a you know he he's deep into the occultism and and everything and he was part of a group of um, lawmen I would say that uh-huh. they they broke up a deep this is this was an occult group that was sacrificing kids these children they were actually slaughtering. And what was what scared him is he was saying, Jeff, the the doctrine that they were using was the right doctrine. He said a lot of the occults that are doing it now kind of don't they're they're they they're making it up as they go, right? He said mm-hmm. what's scary is that the, this group was actually truly truly using the right doctrine. They were, you know, and this is an expert, and he's like, these are, these are documents that that are not published, that are not out there. These are things that are handed down, handed generation down to old generation, books, old rituals. Yes, and he said this group was actually using the right; they were doing the right stuff. And then, you know, one of the, I had uh, Leo Zagami on. He is the head of the Italian Masonic Lodge out of Rome. Hmm. He is actually the Grand Master there. And he was even saying, he's like, look, you know, he's got books out called Confession of the Illuminati and everything. And he's open. And he's like, look, he goes, they've infiltrated the Masonic Lodges. And and that's the whole show. You know, you would think, because you always hear, well, Masons are, 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 you know, are. New world Everybody orders. that I've met is really cool, and I've I've even yeah. thought about joining. You know, well, um, I, I well as you, I think I told you that I'm a Mason. Yeah, you did. And he said he goes he goes the problem is is that the occult and everything is moving in to these lodges, and he goes I'm fighting it every day. He, oh he goes, wow! He goes he goes and I, and we're exposing it. He said because they're they're using the Masonic brotherhood and everything and he goes they're getting so far away from the teachings of of masonry and stuff and they're using it as their their cultists and he goes we have jesuits who have in, infiltrated the uh the lodges and and they're teaching a one world government one world relig- religion Oh, that's and, what they want. That's for sure. And it, it, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, he was on, the, and I was like, yeah. I mean, I've experienced that firsthand in in that mm-hmm. regard, as far mm-hmm. as uh, some of the the occultism, the things that are going on in these. But I've always said that whenever you get people, powerful people, I I had a good friend, and you you see this, in, especially in your industry. I had a real good friend who was a sports uh, manager, and he was um, Magic Johnson's agent when Magic left Michigan and, you know, went with the Lakers, he said it was amazing 
that you know Magic Johnson wanted to be like Bill Cosby. This is at the time, and then Bill Cosby wanted to be. He and and basically what he was getting to is no matter wherever your position in life, you want more power and you want more, 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 and more and more. And especially in L.A., it's one of those things. And he goes, there's a point in which you do sell your soul to get to the next level, you know, to no, get no. to that next level. And he goes, and that's just, that's just natural people wanting more. You're never satisfied with what you've been given, and you want more and more, more, you know, more and more and more and more. And it just, and then there's a point in which you have to cross over. Yeah, it's sort of the human, uh, it, and at least in this culture, in the the the, the capitalist, uh, you know, we're bred for competition, rugged individualism, uh, buy a better truck than your neighbor, be more successful than the next guy. One time, I went into a just talking about programming the nation and, and, and the programming of the the American people. I was in a bowling alley once, and I was looking at twenty different TV screens that were all playing at once. And the 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 five media conglomerates. Uh, there's only five of them now. There used to be like fifty, just to, you know, fifty years ago, even more than that. Uh, n- now everything on TV is only owned by five companies. So. I'm looking at 20 TV screens. One of them is a boxing match, uh, you know, uh, race versus race, city versus city. The other one is a a, a, a basketball game, uh, city versus city. The other one was a football game. Uh, the commercial next to that was just like I said, this guy sitting in his lawn, looking at his brand new truck, looking over, over at his neighbors, waving at them like, hey, look at my new truck. And they're all super bummed because they have the truck from last year and they're just not as cool. Uh, and then we went to the next, uh, TV was like some kind of, uh, news story on uh, violence in the city and fear based. And the next TV was a baseball game and and, and it was all competition based, Mm -hmm. you know, fight for what's yours, support your town or, or, or your, your area or or your another tribe. yeah. Yeah, and, and 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 it was all sort of based on be the most successful person you can be. And, and none of it was about, you know, hey, teamwork, let's be let's let's get together and do something positive for each other and and try to create something beautiful. It was all about get yours and get it now and get it while you can. And in that type of an environment where we're raised, uh, you know, especially in school, I was told that I could have whatever I wanted. I lived in America. I could be a movie star and uh, a, 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 a rock star and a writer and uh, anything I wanted to do at the same time. And, you know, it, that's what we have here yeah. now. You know, we've got greed, a bunch of greed monsters who are all rugged individualists and, and we've got a whole country full of them. And then half of them, or not half of them, most of them aren't educated yeah. because it costs more than a hundred thousand dollars to get a degree. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, it's definitely just a, a weird system. I think it's broken. Uh, I, I was just watching the HBO documentary the other day about how they picked the president. And there's like 160 billionaire families in America mm-hmm. that each one of these presidential candidates have to go to their houses uh, or go to their functions and beg them for money. Yep. And and then basically those 160 families are the ones that give each candidate enough money so that they become the two that they give the so-called people the choice to elect. But all of them are in the pockets of the corporate, the mega rich. And most of those people in my book, some of them may be, there might be a couple of good people that are uh, billionaire trillionaires, but I can't imagine there's that many. And if I had that much money, I mean, what's left to thirst for except for power and control. That's right. That's right. It, 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 you know, you're, you're absolutely right. Everybody wants the next thing. I, firmly believe everybody's like well why would donald trump a multi-billionaire want to be president of the united states because he wants a seat at the table yeah he just wants wants, he wants a seat at the table he doesn't realize he doesn't realize he can buy his way in all he wants to he'll never have a seat because he doesn't have the bloodline 
and yeah and and you know talking about bloodlines i don't know if you ever seen this and and but there was a 12 year old girl who actually uh charted out all of the bloodlines of all the presidents of the united states and every president of the united states has ever been elected has been even including barack obama they're all related to each other wow that will freak you there was only one president that uh it uh but martin van buren is the only president that's ever been elected in the united states that is not related in some way to each other every president in the united states has been, is related by bloodline to one another and that includes barack obama that's obama. insane and to top that off they're all in the rothschilds and the yeah. rockefellers pockets since yeah. day one as yeah. well uh the bankers pockets it's it's you know we live in a to me i always tell people we live in a plutocracy and um it's never really been a democracy and they convince us that we do and uh and then they convince us all if we work real hard we can be just like the rest of the you know there's only 462 billion billionaire families on the planet earth so it's like you know a few people have the dough, a few people make things go, and the rest of us are just scrambling. Cattle. And, um, <laughs> <We're> cattle. <laughs> yeah, just dumb cattle, sheep, yeah. just programmed to Dude. do their, their whatever we want they want us to do. One of, um, this, this is really sad. And if you know the guy, the director that did this, please tell him, mm -hmm. shake his hand, but the idiocracy. Oh, it was a great film. I love that film. I, I yeah. But you know what, though? That is so true. I, I I look at it now, and I'm like, it, it's it's like a must read or must watch in the Norton household. I make all my kids watch. It. <laughs> I really do, and they're like, Dad, I don't want to watch. It's like, no, you have to watch this. You're gonna sit down and watch this with that and Talladega Nights. All right, let me just tell you, you gotta watch Talladega Nights and idiocracy but it, well no, it's i can true. i can give uh, i can give a few handshakes around to talladega nights i know the editor and uh, a few of the folks that worked on that yeah. one so i can give them a props from you <laughs> thanks <It's laughs> baby jesus there but, but you know going back to the social engineering and 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 everything there's a uh, mm -hmm. this all goes back to hitler and and the programs that he implemented but there is in the in the england a lot of the marketing that we do a lot of the stuff that happens in movies that all comes. I don't know if you ever come across these guys, but the, the, the Tavistock Institute out of Britain, have you seen? No, I've never heard of these them. guys have perfected social engineering. They are the experts at mass manipulation. They are the ones that say hospital room walls need to be blue. And, you know, that's, they're into all of that. They're into the, you know, competition, you know, my tribe against your tribe, i.e. football, all the different sports. I mean, these, the, the, they're out of, out of England and they're considered the masters of social manipulation. And it's, a, it's an actual institute that, that you could go and, and they have experts. If you, you know, if you say, look, I want, I want to be able to entice a certain demographic of individual with an ad they will tell you exactly how to do it and it was all started from the from the nazis the guy that started the whole thing he came from the nazis he was part of the uh operation paperclip and uh, you know the brits got him and wow. he started that you know we we got the guys that built the rockets and the bio weapons the brits got the guys that mess with your brain uh -huh. but yeah there yeah, yeah it's called travel i also I think that, that, that as far as like keep the dumbing down of the culture and the dumbing down of just talking about idiocracy, I feel like just just 10 years ago, I had a bigger vocabulary. I was much more focused. I, I, was, uh, I was just smarter, bottom line. And it feels like today that my brain does not fire at the way – it, it doesn't operate at the level that it used to. Uh -huh. And I think that whatever it is, who knows what they're doing, yeah. but whether it's, you know, uh, what are those things called? Those, uh, towers that they pump out all the, uh, they look like trees. Um, 
But whether they're is spraying something in the sky or the zap in our brains or the chemicals that they're putting in our foods, I honestly, it's amazing to me how slow my brain is these days. And it feels to me like something out there is keeping me dumb. Yeah. Well, here, here you go. I'm going to, I'm going to educate you. I'm going to give you a little education here. Okay. Uh, so, so what's the byproduct of uh, a fertilizer? Uh, byproduct of fertilizer. When they make fertilizer and, and everything. A lot Methane, of people don't, I, I don't fluoride. Know. Fluoride's the byproduct. The problem is fluoride. fluoride. No yeah. way. Fluoride is actually the byproduct of fertilizer. If you have fluoride, what's the one thing they put in everybody's water? Fluoride. Exactly. But fluoride is actually considered a, a poisonous chemical. It's considered as a hazardous material chemical. But yet they'll put it in our water thinking that, oh, we all have to have strong teeth and everything. And fluoride oh. on the brain, actually, they they have proven people with high doses of fluoride, you, you it actually eats holes in your brain. And it, and it limits cognitive abilities. The, the thing is, is that when they first started doing fluoride, it was people were still getting their fruits and vegetables locally. But now everything is so processed. So the fluoride that you drink in your water plus the fluoride that you eat in your food, in your processed foods and stuff, we're, all, we're basically dosing ourselves. With uh, dumb juice. Yeah, we're 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 eating eating brains. The other thing too, and I know you're in. You don't want to hear that. What I, I think you're a pretty cool, dude. So I, I think you appreciate this. It, have you ever stopped watching TV? Have you ever noticed that when you stop watching TV for a long period of time, that you feel better and you're more cognitive? Yeah. There, there you go. I haven't been watching TV for quite some time. Uh, okay, good. And, and it's a, it's the you know it's the thing that. Uh, and, and it's because I've been making it. <laughs> and it's, Thank you. It's what I, it's, it's what I battle all myself with, with all the time is like, you know, I, I have to operate within a system that is used to sell people propaganda, program the American public to yep. do, to keep the, the, the status quo as it is. And yet somehow with these five corporations that govern all the places where I can get my art shown, I have to create the art that I want to create and get it shown. Yeah. And then still, most likely, they're going to figure out some way, no matter what I say with my film, to use it to sell uh, whatever they want to sell, War, Budweiser, or whatever the heck else they're slinging that day. Um, by the time it gets to television or, or yeah. you know, commercials and et cetera. Um, but, it, you know, I'm stuck between a rock and in a, in a hard place because making, making good uh, entertainment, um, especially entertainment that, that makes people think, and makes people feel more empathetic to each other. When I walk out of a good movie that really touches my heart, and I and I remember that, oh my gosh, you know, we all are the same exact thing. We're made up of the same molecules, the same chemicals. The same, the, there's no difference between you and me, Mister Norton. We are the exact same thing. Um, I'm just eight times that, you. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's that, that, size you know, wise. That's a, size wise. <laughs> That's a that's a big thing, and so you know I, I just got to keep doing what I'm doing only because it's the only thing that makes me happy. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, you know there there certainly are a whole lot more of us out there uh, doing things uh, self motivated and, and not not for the team, well, or, I, or not for the group. And that's why you know that's why there's a huge push. I mean this thing. I mean, think about it. Before, if I wanted to be on the radio, if I wanted to be heard by thousands of people, I'd have to be on the radio. And when I yep. walk into that radio studio, there's a little red phone that sits there. I'm sure you've seen yep. them in studios. There's a little yep. red phone. And there literally is. A, we joke about it, but there is. When you go into a radio studio, there is a red phone sitting there, and it's under the desk. And in the newsroom, there's a red phone sitting there. It's under the desk. And that's where the guys that, that call the shots... I think of the two guys from uh, Good Morning Vietnam. 
you know, the two twins that were, that were doing, that's what I think of when I see that red phone, but the internet and YouTube has allowed us the freedom to do what we do. Now, YouTube now is starting to get that way as well, because what they do is they'll, they'll pile up a bunch of mistakes that you've made in your shows. And then once you step over the line, they'll come back at you and say, uh, you violated it. You know, I've had artists, I've had musical artists on the show and I played their music as the artist is there to talk about their music and everything. And the next mm-hmm. day I get ding for YouTube for, for yeah, copyright. It, it, it it, yeah. But we, we get it all cleared up and stuff. But all my buddies who've been doing YouTube for a long period of time, they said, don't think for a minute that YouTube's not keeping track, even though they come back and say, Oh yeah, you have rights to use that. When you get to a certain point and you tip over the Apple cart or you mm-hmm. say something disparaging against, you know, someone that they're supporting, they, all that stuff will come back up and they'll shut you down and they'll shut you down for three or four weeks, just long enough to, so that you lose that, that viewership and every, because they know people have a short attention spans and they move on. Um, yeah. And that, that's the, 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 you know, that's the beast that we deal with. You just have to be smarter than that and be independent. I mean, that's why we'll always have an independent station outside of all of the mainstream stuff. We'll always have that because, you know, we saw that with, have you been on George Norrie's show coast to coast? I would love to be. I have not had the pleasure to talk with George yet. Okay. I've been looking to try to get that done. Oh, well, we might be able to help you there. Believe it or not, I, we might be able to give you a little insight there. But, That'd uh, be great. I, I, yeah. you know, it's sort of a dream to actually sit there and, and talk to that man. I've, I've loved his show for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I, You know, I, I stopped listening to it, of course, when Art left. But, uh, you know, George is still the, the king of the block when it comes to late night. And, uh, and no, we still have ties. I've had a couple people that were like, Hey, if you ever want to fill in, let me know. And it's like, yeah, we're going a different direction than, than, than George, but he's always mm-hmm. looking for people to fill in for him and, and stuff. And so, and I do know we've had a couple of guests that, that are like, Hey, look, we'll, we'll pass your name well, along to him. If you happen to fill in, man, there's a few people in my cast that are also way into this stuff. We should all come oh. down there and, and do it. Yeah, cool. Well, get them on my show. <laughs> well, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, um, tell them, tell them about us. We'd love to have them. We're we're definitely, you know, we're we're friendly. And and right. uh, see, the problem with George and even you know, Brad, well, Brad said it on the show, so I guess I could repeat it. it wasn't in confidence. Brad Olson. Like I said, does a lot of the History Channel stuff. He does the Ancient Alien stuff. He wrote the the Future uh, Esoteric books and and so and and he he him and George do that. Uh, they produce a show together. George has its own his own show. Uh, I can't think of the name, but they Brad does production work with them on that. And and he said, look, he goes the problem because you know I want to be at that level. He goes, no, you don't. And I'm like, why? And he said, because then you can't do the shows you you like doing. And I was like, why? He goes, they're not going to let you do it. And it's like, oh, I'll always do it. And he's like, no, you don't understand. They won't let you. When you get to his level, the the powers to be, the five networks, the you know, the families and stuff, the yeah. advertisers, they they make it perfectly clear that they. You, you are not, to, there are certain things you are not to do. That's why John B. John B. Wells uh, left or got fired. You know, mm. he took a, he has George Norrie. That's the other one you might want to look at is getting on John B.'s show. John B. has over a million five listeners where George Norrie only has about 200,000. That'd be incredible. I haven't heard of his show. What's it called? It's uh, Caravan to Midnight. Caravan and it's all Midnight. subscription. He does not. It you it's no free pot. It's all subscription based. You actually have to uh, subscribe to his uh, to his show. I mean, you. you What's you his name? John B. John B. Wells. Yeah. John B. Wells. Yeah. Great guy. I mean, great great guy. Cool cat. You know. And uh, he he was he filled in for George a lot on the weekends. He did the Saturday night show, and then what happened was. He was he was bringing in like 2.5 2.6 million listeners. He mm-hmm. was just he was crushing it 
you know, compared to George. And then he, you know, he got in the 9-11 was an inside job kind of stuff. And there was some, you know, at that point, they kind of, the power yeah, kicked in and said, look, shut up, stop talking. And he's like, go F yourself. He goes, I'm leaving, start my own network. But yeah, he has a, it's called Caravan the Midnight. Uh, great, sure. great, great show. But it, you have to pay to listen to it, though. It's a subscription only. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, of course, nine eleven was an inside job. Give me a break. Uh, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that's I, another I, topic for another night. But yes, I agree with yeah. you. I, 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 I have so many friends who are like, "You're crazy for." It's like, look, the government knew it was coming. They're opportunist. Our government is opportunist. They, we are they, run by the military industrial complex yes. and the banks and they yes. want war and they yeah. figured out how to make a war that would never end because they could call it the war on terror, just like the war on drugs. Yep. And it could just go on and on and on and yep. they could keep building bombs and keep using them. And it, it was brilliant. It was yep. a brilliant maneuver. I got to give those guys props for their, yep. Yep. Their well, one, of, process. one of one of my best friends who's a, you know, he's a trader at the Chicago Board of Trade. He said, you know, war, pestilence, and famine. He goes, those are those are the three keys to making money. He goes, we yep. got to have them. And it, that's what we sell, man. That's our, that's our one of our biggest. Uh, Products? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think the great. sleep demons are calling me to sleep. I think I need to get some rest. Yeah, man. I, hey, I, dude, I appreciate it. And, uh. You know, we'll be we'll be in touch, and uh, yeah, I will, thanks I, for having me on anytime. Oh, yeah. And I'll talk to some of my cast and um, those of you out there, especially that uh, heard about the circuit tonight. If you haven't heard about it, just go to the website and check it out, thecircuitfilm.com. If you're into uh, the sci-fi, fantasy, horror, superhero genres, you'll see the explanation of this wonderful film we're working on and um i hope you join us yeah. and, and jeff thanks for having me on man i had a blast and uh we'll do this again sometime oh, soon Oh, absolutely let, yeah keep me in touch let me know how things are going and and everything with the fundraising and if we need to you know i'll, I'll promote give me give me whatever you want me to say whatever i gotta do i'll, I'll be your i'll be your your whore cool man <laughs> did you send me your email i i, I don't have your out yeah, I've got your Text stuff. Text it to me, I'll, and, I'll, yeah, and okay. I'll send you mine. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll stay in touch and stuff. I'll make sure that, you know, I've got, like I said, we didn't take any breaks while you were on, but we do do eight-minute eight, 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 uh, eight minute breaks, and that's for radio stations. So if you have promos, if you have any audio promos on what you're doing, I'll slip your promos in there during the during the show breaks. And also, if you have oh, any YouTube great. stuff, uh, you know, 30-second 30, 30 clips or whatever i'll slip those in as well on the youtube feeds i'll, I'll oh, promote the yeah. heck out of your stuff man yeah i can ship that stuff off to you give yeah. me a, a few days i'll get a few together yeah, absolutely. um absolutely. and uh what was the last thing i was going to say to you um man it's getting late that's i think my brain is just not starting right. to operate correctly i think it's the uh the the, the crop dusting i mean the uh whatever it's called the uh <laughs> hey the, when you go to canada more i Water. Make sure you get yourself a bag of uh, Jimmy Horton's coffee, my friend. That's what you need. You need some Jimmy Horton's. That's what you need. I do need a coffee. I think that would be <laughs> delicious. Some of that mocha latte crap that you guys drink over there. In the way. <laughs> Go get yourself some real good, you know, Canadian Jimmy Hortons, and uh, and everything. And, and no, they don't sponsor me. But I just I'm, I, I figure if I say their yeah. name long enough and in the shows eventually someone in their marketing department will ship me a case they better start shipping it out yeah <laughs> that's it take care of yourself uh, thanks my friend all right take care manu yeah. itarami joining us that was awesome what a great conversation as you guys know we did not take any breaks i i wanted to hear what he had to say and man was it a lot and was it cool as I'll get out, as I would say. I'm trying to keep it clean here. We still, we still have to run a clean ship here. You know, we're we're about ten minutes before we're done. I I see you guys in chat. I wanted to. Isn't the UN uh, supposed to monitor the internet? So that is actually false. But let me tell you how that works. I'm going to answer your question there, Freedom First. The way the law is written. All right. 
So ICANN, which is the company or the organization that is over the DNS entries, we are in the United States are giving that up. We're getting rid of the ICANN entries. Uh, and it goes, as of today, actually, it goes over. The problem is, is by international law, ICANN in itself is considered a monopoly. So in order for it not to be considered a monopoly, you know, governments can monopolize whatever they want. They're governments. They got tanks, boats, ships, soldiers, guns, nuclear warheads. So government can do whatever they want to do. So in theory, there's a backdoor for the United Nations. The ICANN, so it does not get prosecuted by foreign countries as a monopoly, has to be sponsored by a government agency. Well, the issue is, is what government's going to do it? The United States is giving it up. Do you want Germany? Do you want China? Do you want, you know, God forbid China's in control of the internet? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I have to go sweep in pools starting tomorrow if, if that was the case. So what, what's happened is, is now the United Nations is going to step in and be that government body. They're the ones that are going to do it. So, so what happened is that we got in Rundin is, is what happened. Because if the American, you know, ICANN was the American, we were in charge of the internet. We were in charge of the DNS. We were in charge of all that. And it, so those that don't know, when you type in the midnightocean.com, that actually goes to a computer address. And every computer, every website has a unique address. And the organization that maintains that was ICANN, or the DNS entry group. They were the ones, they, they made sure that when you typed in the midnightocean.com that you went to this particular server, or, you know, to this IP address, which then, of course, was, was my webpage. Now, if you allow government, say China, say China doesn't like me for whatever reason, they probably don't, I don't care. Uh, I, well, I know any, you know, there's a lot of countries that don't like me. They can, the, instead of you, when you type in the midnightocean.com, they can send you to the midnightocean.com Chinese version, which is all hail China governments, the best government in the world. And we all need to listen to whatever they say, right? As I say, so that's the danger of, of, of this is now you have the United Nations that will eventually have control of the ICANN system because, you know, God forbid, we don't want China to have it. We don't want Russia to have it. We don't want all these others. So they're going to give it to the United Nations. The problem I see with that, the United Nations, they're not so, how do you say, malevolent or benevolent. <laughs> they're not so benevolent themselves. You know, there's a lot of things that the United Nations don't like that we do here in America, i.e. guns. You know, if you're a gun person, the United Nations made it perfectly clear. They want to pass laws that allow countries to come in and prosecute gun manufacturers. They actually want to pass laws that will, the United Nations, that if you are a gun dealer, a, a small mom and pop shop, you can be prosecuted internationally. So there's a lot of things there that if you, uh, you know, if the United Nations, you know, they can pretty much shut down all gun websites, right? That's the danger. That's exactly the danger with this. And because they don't hold the same the same principles. I mean, our government has changed so much in the last 12 years or so. And it's not, and I don't want to say it's just Barack Obama. I want to say, you know, since Kennedy, our government's changed. And it's become worse every, every progression. It get, it's like leapfrog. It gets worse and worse. It doesn't matter who's in office. That's why I don't like it. None of them. That's why I write in my candidates. But the, the thing is, is that that is the issue at hand here. And it, as of today, the, the ICANN is no longer controlled or no longer, they no longer, the United States government no longer has authority over them. And now they're their own entity. Uh, they're going to get sued. The, the play here is, is they're going to get sued as a monopoly. Then once they get sued as a monopoly, the United Nations is going to come riding in on the white horse. And they are going to say, we will take it over. And then, of course, the United Nations can route, 
route commerce any way they want to. The other thing too is when they when they control DNS, they can see what computer's going where. Because every time you type in the midnightocean.com, your IP address is tagged, you know, does a DNS lookup on their servers, and then their servers then return the IP address of the midnight patriot, you know, midnightocean.com, and then that route, so they they know what you're looking up. So yeah. You got to, you know, this is pretty serious stuff. This is new world order stuff. And, and it's very important. And now how do you, how do you resolve that? Well, there are ways and we're, we're looking at ways ourselves. You can build what they call a mesh network. You can build a virtual private network, a VPN system in which you control the DNS. So patriots can still talk to each other. There's a lot of different techniques and things that you can do to, to do that. So I just wanted to answer that question for you out there in freedom first. That's how that stuff works. Uh, and, and trust me, there are, there are people working really hard to, to circumvent uh, any kind of, or any form of censorship. And, and it's, it's scary stuff that, that absolutely can and will happen. It's a natural progression. You got to remember, government is like a living creature. It wants to live. It wants to grow. That's, unfortunately, that's like anything else. It's taking on a, a, a form of itself. So, wow, what a night. I want to appreciate Manu Itarami for joining us and uh, talking about his new project. And, you know, it's very important that we support, you know, the, the circuit. Um, you know, this is... How do I say this? There's a lot of crap coming out of, it's all CGI. It's all this. It's all that. It's not entertainment. It's just overload, right? It, it's kind of like, how can we one up the next? You have a eight headed monster. Well, I want a 12 headed monster. It's kind of like spinal tap. I got, I got 11. Why do you have 11? Because 11 is louder than 10, right? And that's what's coming out of Hollywood. And it's refreshing to know that a lot of these artists are coming together and they're starting to do their own thing. And that's why the circuit is very important. If you have a script or whatever, get it out there. Get it out to them. Who knows? You might be the next, you might, <laughs> might be the next Harvey Weinstein. Who knows? You never know until you try. I can tell you. I, I you know, I, I would have never thought that I'm at where I'm at today, but I try, I, you know, I started this up a month ago and look at where we're at already. We're growing this. We're talking about, we're talking with a syndicator to syndicate us. You gotta, you, you gotta put one foot in front of the other. You gotta, gotta charge on man and everything. So it's very important. And, and, the reason, like I said, getting back to the reason why I am so much behind the circuit and what, what Manu is doing is not because I like the guy, but I do like the guy. He's, he's a pretty decent guy. I think you guys heard it here. He's not a typical Hollywood type. He's, he's a you and I. And most of the guys that, that I'm sure that he's going to be bringing and helping maybe coming in on our show, it, he's a you, you, know, you and I kind of guy. These are guys that we look at and go, wow. But then you find out they put their pants on. They lose their keys just like the rest of us. And they believe what we believe. And that's that's cool. And But we need to support that because what happens is if we don't support independent film like this, we lose the art. We lose the entertainment value. You know, there's a reason why movies are, are flopping left and right. These big production movies putting all the star power and stuff because they're not entertaining at the end of the day. They don't appeal to your emotions. They don't, there's no empathy there. You're not associating. You're not, you're not feeling and stuff. So a lot of the things I believe like this are, with what they're doing and stuff, I think you're, it's going to be entertaining. I can already tell you, I was laughing my, I got a lot of ass to laugh off <laughs> and I was their trailer. 
if you haven't seen it, you got to go and see Russ. It, this is hilarious. And if you scroll down, I'm, I'm going to show you how to do it. So if you go to the Facebook and you go to the circuit, or if you go to the circuitfilm.com, it's a little bit different for those that are on the circuit film. Actually, we'll go to the circuitfilm.com because that's, I think, probably that's easier. So the circuit, let me type this in circuitfilm.com. You go to that page and you scroll that 19 more days until they launch for their thing, but for the Kickstarter. But you go down, there's a there's a video there. The first video, it, uh, error occurred. Huh, I have to look at that. See, they're already they're already messing with them. There you go. So the first video is that they have it's called uh Go to catch them all. Got to got got to catch them all. This is hilarious stuff. And it was done and if you look um it has Russ and it also has that's uh Manu on there, but it's so true. I mean, if I was an alien, this is, and I was a captain of a ship, this is exactly what I would do. I'd be messing with the dude's head. And that's exactly, this is hilarious what he's doing. And, you, you know, but this is independent film at its best. But it's hilarious. It's entertaining. It's just, it's just funny as, as all get out. So you have that one. That's one trailer. They're going to do a trailer a week. The other one that they, that they just did is, uh, uh, yeah, we are the the official uh, teaser trailer. A new John Irving. I mean, take a look at it, and then you have Russ out there who is doing <laughs> doing kind of like an intro about what the project's about. That's hilarious as well, and you know it's entertaining. It's it's very very entertaining. It makes you like film again, and it makes you like watching a movie again. And so I, you know, highly recommend that you uh, you get out there, you support this. I mean, it, it's very important that we support independent film. So the circuitfilm.com, uh, or if you're on Facebook, the circuit, that's all you have to put in. So with that being said, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. It's been an incredible night. I thoroughly appreciate all of your comments in the room. I hope we brought you another great show. I think we have. And uh, with Manu Itarami joining us and everything. If you are new to our show, please make sure that you subscribe there on Facebook. Follow us on, or subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook. It's really easy. You just type in The Midnight Ocean. Also, make sure that you uh, join our listener group, which is Midnight Listeners. Follow us on Twitter. We won't spam you. We're not going to send you, you know, cute kittens. And I always say this. I'm not going to ask you to clean my goldfish bowl or whatever they do, a farm bill or whatever it is these days they do. So get out there. I appreciate it. I appreciate the sport. You know, tell your friends about us. Let them know. Even though you have friends that can't stay up as late as we do they can always you can always go to our site and download i think we finally got our approval for uh for itunes so i if you type in the midnight ocean in itunes it will come up it comes up on my computer now but i actually registered for mine so we have that as well you can uh also, follow us through RSS feed. If you go to the Facebook, if someone asked us where our RS, RSS feed was, if you go to our menu item and you go to the upper right, right before the menu, right next to YouTube, that little speaker looking icon, that's the RSS. So if you have a uh, mobile phone or whatever, you can just click on that. And if it has any kind of podcast software on there, we're locked in. You automatically will get downloaded. So there's a lot of opportunity, but tell your friends about us. Um, that's awesome that we 84 on YouTube. The, the number is 100. That's our goal. And then, uh, you know, our first 100, we'd love to have 100 subscribers to our YouTube channel, uh, the likes and everything. So there you go. So, you know, keep, keep coming out to the page. 
and uh, you know, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed tonight. And whatever I can do to make the show better, please, please let me know. Uh, the best way to reach me is through Facebook right now. Uh, join the Midnight Ocean. You can message me. I would be glad to, to listen to you. Also in the chat rooms during the live chats and everything. So without further ado, I think it is time that we say good night and end with our theme song. This song is actually, um, and Whoa. end with, <laughs> here we go. We got the echo and the echo and the echo here. Let me get off that and do that. And this is from our good friend who's going to be joining us on the 30th, September 30th. He's going to be back. But this is Ed Roman. Good night.